So, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, panelists, and colleagues, my name is Jean D'Aragon, Senior Sustainable Development Expert at the UN Office for Sustainable Development, or UNOSD, in Incheon, Republic of Korea. I would like to welcome and thank you all for joining this first session of the executive training course for policymakers on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This training course is organized by UNOSD, which is part of the ESA Division for Sustainable Development Goals. The general objective of this training course is to build knowledge, skills, mindset, and general capacities of member states for implementing sustainable development planning, policy making, and policy shaping show an integrated approach. This year, like every year, the course is closely linked to the high-level political forum on sustainable development, referred to HLPF, which will take place in New York in July 2022. We'll try to achieve a better understanding of successes, challenges, lessons learned, and good practices related to the implementation of SDG4 on quality education, five on gender equality, 14 on life below water, 15 on life on land, and 17 on partnerships for the goals, which are the five sustainable development goals or SDGs that will be the focus of attention during the HLPF next July. In previous years, the executive training course for policymakers on the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, also referred to as the executive training or the ETC by the former participants, brought together about 100 participants from all over the world to learn from the lectures and discussions over four to five days in Incheon City in South Korea. Unfortunately, last year and this year again, we could not hold a training in person due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Hence, it is taking place through a series of 2.5 hour online sessions over four days from the 11th to the 14th of April. We hope to go back to our traditional or normal in-person format for all our capacity building activities and particularly for the next edition of the executive training as soon as possible. <clears> Through <throat> the presentations and discussions during the week, we hope that this training course will help you understand better the issues around the HLPF, the five SDGs that will go under in-depth review to the voluntary national reviews next July, and actively take part in the implementation and review process of the SDGs in your own countries. In this session, we'll hear our distinguished opening speakers and panelists of diverse backgrounds from across the world who are involved in one way or another in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. We'll hear first, uh, we'll have a video, um, it's called From Formative Education to Skill Development, Pathways and Policy Consideration. Second, we'll have uh, the current state of the education for sustainable development and impact of COVID-19 and its achievement in the context of SDG4, challenges and needed interventions, partnerships for learning outcome, productive lived lives and national development, a quality assurance approach. We also have country experiences. Uh, first, we'll have the education for economic and social mobility, the Swiss dual system of learning. We'll also hear about lifelong learning, skill upgrading and recognition of prior learning, country experience today and challenges. And then we'll have raising awareness for sustainable development in Nigerian schools. And lastly, we'll have the youth empowerment and sustainable development case in uh, Indonesia. Thank you. Now we'll have, uh, without further ado, let's start with the welcoming remarks of our distinguished speakers. We'll hear uh, from Mr. Alexander Tropokov, officer in charge, 
Div uh, Division of Sustainable Development Goals in the UNDESA. And we'll hear uh, Mr. Chong Kyu Park, head of office at UNOSD. Unfortunately, Mr. Alexander Trepelkov, Director of Division for Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, in the UN Department of Economic Social Affairs, we call it UNDESA, cannot be with us today due to often seen uh, unforeseen uh, circumstances. So I will. I was asked to deliver the remarks, so I'll change just my hat, and I will uh, now um, deliver the Mr. Uh, Trepelkov's remarks. Let me just... Uh, Distinguished participants, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, I'm pleased to welcome you to the seventh edition of the Executive Training Calls for Policymakers on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Mr. Chong Kyu Park, head of the UN Office for Sustainable Development, our project office in Incheonsi, in the Republic of Korea, for organizing and convening this event. Having participated in this training as a speaker, I have witnessed its contribution to enhancing the capacities of policymakers and other stakeholders from around the world who normally gather in Chun to benefit from informative lectures and discussions on SDG implementation and progress review. Unfortunately, we cannot meet in person this year again due to the COVID-19 pandemic. While I sincerely hope we will be able to all next year's session in person, your presence today is statement it is, uh, of your quest to learn and benefit from this capacity building activity. Distinguished participants, as the Secretary General has warned, we are moving backwards in relation to many of the sustainable development goals because our world is suffering from the impact of unprecedented emergency uh, caused by numerous challenges that include the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate change crisis, disaster, desertification, biodiversity loss, and now uh, new ongoing conflicts. The COVID-19 crisis alone has exposed massive shortcomings to multiculturalism, from vaccine inequity to a lack of financial solidarity, while the conflict in Ukraine has accelerated the upward trend in oil and natural gas prices, causing high inflation around the globe. As a result, global, global economic recovery hinges on a delicate balance amid new wages, new waves of of COVID-19 infection, persistent labor market challenges, and lingering supply chain constraints. Even before the conflict, developing countries were struggling to recover from the pandemic with record inflation, rising interest rates, and looming debt burdens, especially for the in highly inhabited poor countries. All these developments are hitting the poorest and more vulnerable countries and people the hardest. To get back on track and build back better, we must redouble our efforts to accelerate implementation of the SDGs and recovery from COVID-19 by leveraging the innovative ideas in the Secretary's General Report on our common, common agenda that calls for a new global deal to ensure power, wealth, and opportunities are shared more broadly. Ladies and gentlemen, to address the ground loss during the pandemic, member states will be meeting in July at the United Nations High-Level Political Forum for Sustainable Development to discuss building back better from the COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This theme is at the art of policymaking and international cooperation across the world, including this executive training course that you are participating in. At this year's HLPF, 
countries will have an opportunity to exchange experiences, lessons on policies that they have implemented for recovering from COVID-19 while addressing the negative impacts of the pandemic on the implementation of the 2030 agenda and moving on to attract to realize the sustainable development goals within the decade of action and delivery. Distinguished participants, our interior changes and interdependencies mean that we advance by learning from each other and sharing our experiences. DESA is the think tank of the United Nations, dedicated to sharing knowledge and expertise with as broad range of stakeholders and decision makers as possible, including member states, major groups, the general publics, and others. In that regard, we have published a series of policy briefs on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis, as well as online tools and platforms for stakeholders to share examples of SDG implementation. This includes SDG acceleration actions, an online database of new and ambitious voluntary initiatives, such as announcing or financing a new or enhanced policy program or project to the 2030 agenda. As of February, 325 such actions have been published, supplied by governments, civil society, UN entities, the private sector, and academia. I encourage participants to peruse DESA resources and promote them among your governments and institutions. This will allow us to continue mobilizing actions and galvanizing our collective response to crisis to our shared success stories, ideas, and creativity. Distinguished participants, the program we, we are embarking on today takes its cue from this year's HLPF and will focus on SDGs on quality education, gender equality, life below water, life on land, and partnerships for the goal. It will examine the effects and opportunities arising from the pandemic on these specific goals and the entire SDG spectrum. While the 2022 HLPF serves as the backbone of the training course, the latter is also guided by the scientific assessment in the 2019 Global Sustainable Development Report that underscores the importance of approaching these goals through the lens of governance, capacity building, and education, policy and institutional coherence, and individual and collective behaviors. Given the complexity and expense of these issues and themes, as well as the technical challenges of participating online, this four-day program is an ambitious one. But I believe your personal commitment and participation will help you better contribute to accelerate the implementation of the SDGs, review and report on the progress made in your respective countries. 2022 is the midpoint to 2030 along a roadmap that began with the adoption of the SDGs and the climate agreement in 2015. We also marked the 50th 50th anniversary of the 1972 UN Conference on UN Environment in Stockholm, the first ever UN Conference on Sustainable Development. Preparations are also underway for major UN conferences on ocean, water, and climate. These major conferences and events are important, an important platform for UN member states to continue searching for sustainable solutions to the myriad challenges countries are facing. You have a role to play in these deliberations, and I encourage you to take back home the lessons you will learn over the next four days and translate them into sustainable solutions in your national context to achieve sustainable development 
within the remaining eight years of the decade of action for the SDGs. Let us all strongly reaffirm the importance of multiculturalism, global solidarity and peace to build back better everywhere, address inequalities between and within countries and leave no one behind. Thank you very much. Um, now I would like to um, invite Mr. Uh, chong Yu Park to deliver his uh, welcome remarks. Mr. Park, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, John. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the place where you're at. Distinguished guest speakers, guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you all to the 2021 to 22 Executive Training Course, ETC, for policymakers on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. First of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks to my colleagues, including those of the divisions for Sustainable Development Goals, UN DESA, for their you know, continued cooperation. Also, my most sincere gratitude goes to all the speakers, participants here today for joining us from different time zones and parts of the world. While I'm very grateful to connect with you all today online, I'm hopeful that we will soon be able to greet each other in person again at the future ETC. In our collective efforts to accelerate the implementation of the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development, the ETC annually brings together senior government officials, international experts, scholars, practitioners, and actors, representatives of regional and international organizations, and of civil society and private sectors for building and sharing the knowledge, skills, mindsets, as well as general capacities of member states for implementing certain different policies through an integrated approach. In particular, this year's edition of the ETC guided by the 2022 HLPF, partially by the 2021 to 22 Sustainable Development Transformation Portal SETF had held just last month, we'll discuss the theme building back better from the COVID-19 while advancing the full on implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development by focusing on five SDGs, namely SDG 4 on quality education, five SDG 5 on gender equality, SDG 14 on life below water, 15 on life on land, and 17 on partnership, partnerships for the goals. In doing so, we'll have the important opportunity this week to examine how we can advance the implementation of the 23 agenda through the lenses of governance, capacity building, and education, policy, and institutional coherence, as well as individual and collective behaviors and efforts. Distinguished participants, as we have all witnessed, the COVID-19 pandemic has further unveiled the underlying social economic challenges that have been prevailing for far too long. Reflecting and deri deriving from this, the objective of this year's ETC is to identify challenges and potential solutions for our COVID-19 crisis recovery, recovery efforts, and the implementation of the 23 agenda by discussing the impacts of the pandemic, particularly on SDGs 4, 5, 14, and 15, and 17. As we will hear more from today's presentations on the topic of advancing the 23 agenda through education, vocational training, and capacity building, the pandemic has a direct impact SDG 4 on quality education as access to education has drastically fallen with over 1 billion children at risk of behind and above. 
31% of school children worldwide having no access to internet-based remote learning. The presentation today will help us develop a strong understanding of how SDG4, which is about ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all, can be achieved as we build back better from the COVID-19 pandemic. Tomorrow's session on SDG 5, Gender Equality, a gender perspective on building back better from the COVID-19 pandemic, will help us further discuss the significant impact the COVID-19 crisis had on gender equality progress, particularly for women in de developing countries or facing even growing inequalities. There has been a sharp rise in gender-based violence, child marriage, and unpaid work, for example, since the beginning of the pandemic. Echoing the focus of the SDG 5 on achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls will help us examine how we can incorporate the gender lens into analyzing achieving the other SDGs. Day three on SDG 14, Life Below Water, how the oceans can help us fight against and recover from COVID-19 and deliver the SDGs will let's dissect the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the ocean and marine life in which we also have the opportunity to highlight their short and long-term impact on different communities, such as small-scale fisheries and marine tourism and learn from national experience and research on how we can protect life below water as we build back better. For last but not least, day four on SG15, Life on Land, how COVID-19 recovery and the 23rd agenda can only be fully achieved through addressing SG15, we'll focus on building a deep understanding of integral role of climate action in our COVID-19 pandemic recovery efforts and the implementation of the 20th agenda. Therefore, we will hence allow the participants to not only analyze the impact of the pandemic on the environment, but also learn how we can protect this through and promote the sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainable major forests, combat desertification, and holes and rivers land degradation and biodiversity loss. The pandemic has importantly shown us that in order to achieve the transitory agenda for sustainable development, we must not only build back better, but also forward better. We must then also fully understand the importance and the strong interlinkages between the different SDGs, which will be further highlighted through the invaluable discussions from distinguished speakers at this year's ETC. The UNOSD is committed to promoting the implementation of the 2030 Agenda through strengthening cooperation with members of international organizations, national institutions, and civil stakeholders. As highlighted through SDG 17, the challenge is enormous. But so are our capabilities when we act together. The UNOSD will hence continue to foster knowledge sharing and capacity building platforms through the various forums such as this, this year's edition of executive training course. Once again, I sincerely thank every single one of you for joining this year's edition of the ETC, and I look forward to the discussion to follow. I hope that the knowledge, findings, and messages shared throughout the ETC will allow us to further effectively and collectively work toward building a sustainable future as we continue our efforts to build back better, let right forward, better from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Chung Gil Park, uh, head of office, UN OSD. Thank you for these thoughtful comments. And um, now uh, I would like to now to move on with, uh, I'd like to introduce you, Ms. Uh, Licha Sainer Yu, who's Professor Organization Development and Institutional Learning. And she is our 
uh, UNOSD consultant. She has been working with UNOSD, uh, providing support regarding the organization and holding of some other events in the past, including the executive training calls for policymakers over the last couple of years. We're happy to see her again this year. Ms. Senna Yu, I am giving the floor to you now. We can't hear you. I think you're you're muted. I should see at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, just a small technical problem, but we will resolve this. She may change computer. Excuse, uh, please excuse me. Uh, <laughs> For the inconvenience, as life goes, that's always unexpected. My screen, for some reason, is unfrozen, so I cannot really move anything. Uh, so let me uh, just I just switched over to my partner and uh, and colleague and everything else. Raymond Sanders' seat uh, for, to continuing uh, on this uh, on this session. Uh, so let me first uh, thank. Uh, both uh, distinguished speakers, especially in person, Mr. Park, for a very enlightening uh, and also insightful uh, speech open and opened up the, the whole session in a very sort of visionary and, in, uh, and also uh, thoughtful manner. In view of the time that we have and also the number of distinguished speakers, let me not to, uh, to sort of say more words, but instead to in introduce the first input from Mr. Andreas Schleicher. Uh, he's the Director of, for Education at OECD and has been personally instrumental in initiating uh, different uh, uh, projects that allow us to have a better insight in addition uh, to, to the work of UNESCO uh, about actual conditions uh, in terms of education uh, today. But let me sort of use uh, the slide, uh, the, uh, the slides that I found from the from the SDNS, uh, SDSN's website on the uh, SDG dashboard. Next page, please. And this gives us a very strong visual image in terms of what is the current situation in meeting SDG four uh, on on target. We still have eight years to go. But you could see the challenge remains uh, quite daunting. Uh, it requires not only national uh, effort, but also international collaboration and collective effort to change the picture. Of course, the, the, the indicators used uh, on this map for this particular visualization and map is mostly quantitative and not so qualitative. And that is the focus of today, what we would like to talk about, is to look beyond the student en enrollment and achievement in terms of increasing student numbers in the higher education uh, institutions, but rather to raise and answer and address a fundamental question. What is education for? And I think that we can look at this particular question from three different levels. From individual, it's about livelihood, for the collective as a, as a country, it is about increasing the productivity of the country. And in other words, we would like to perform better and to participate in the global uh, value chain and supply chain. After all, you know, uh, the prosperity, the third P in the SDG um, agenda, uh, the prosperity cannot be achieved if 
we failed the people who do not have the right skills and the talents and the imagination and the, and the desire and commitment to actually to you know seek out and achieve again for life but at the same time we also need to look at you know what is the the global situation in this particular regard because there are very complex issues related to 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 culture to tradition to norms to the stereotypical image of gender uh, and also we have to recognize the impact in terms of the environment in this whole picture so it's a very comprehensive and complex uh, challenge if we want to achieve quality education for all and achieving a purpose so let me with with this few words to you know to introduce the next speaker which i already mentioned doc, you know mr andre schlacher he's the director of for education and skills and he is currently on mission in Uzbekistan, and it's very kind to send us his video uh, recorded uh, message to share with us and i mentioned that he has been instrumental in initiating a few key instruments for us to benchmark and to get a deeper insight in terms of the learning outcome. One is PISA study, which is looking at benchmarking all the age 16s across the world and in, in more than 130 countries to see how well have they learned in terms of some of the fundamental skills in order to continue learning in life. And second, more recent initiative, it's called PIACA, which is comparing the adults in terms of their skills, whether they are in this really cha you know, fast changing, fast transforming world, are the adults who have already completed and finished their formal education, so-called life, can they move ahead through the opportunities offered throughout their life course, the possibility to also improve their skills knowledge and to find a place for themselves in the future of work as has been very clearly de deliberated and articulated in the UN context and also by the ILO. So with, with these few words, I would uh, introduce to you the, the video uh, keynote address for today. And we will come with the video. Hello, and thank you so much for inviting me to contribute to your education program at UNOST. At this moment, our eyes are still very much focused on the pandemic. But if you have one thing learned over the last, you know, months and years, it's that the future is always going to surprise us. Climate change is going to disrupt our lives a lot more than this pandemic. And artificial intelligence puts up so much greater uncertainty. We know how to educate second class robots, you know, people are very good at repeating what we told them. But what's going to make us human? in a world in which the kind of things that are easy to teach and test have also become easy to digitize, to automate. And then there are many other trends that, you know, shape the future of education, the future of our societies. Let's look at some of the sources of economic growth these days. One thing is clear, you know, you can see that the future is always intangible. An example of their power is the growth of a very few tech companies compared to the declining revenue of the traditional companies that dominated the Fortune 500 some decades ago. And the great thing is that, you know, unlike tangible assets, knowledge can be used infinitely. You can use it in many times in many different places. And that explains the rapid growth of those companies that are engaged in the development of intangibles. And of course, you know, intangibles are about people and people are about skills. Another way to look at this, you know, is the tra trademark applications. In education, you know, 
we should ask ourselves, you know, what competencies are needed for participating in this increasingly intangible economy? Where, you know, ideas count, no? contributions that we make to the intellectual development of our companies. No? What are the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, the values that we need to generate new ideas, new products, no? or for organizing, governing new ways of working, new ways of producing? And of course, you know, technology firms are also getting involved in the business of education itself, you know, particularly during the pandemic, developing new learning platform, new ways of learning, giving people greater ownership over what they learn and how they learn and when they learn and where they learn. We also should see the new workplaces. Now, one of the things that is emerging so clearly is the polarization of our labor markets. Now, those with the right skills never had the life chances they have today. But those who struggle with the transition to the future have never faced greater risks than they do today. That's the new economy, the new labor market, a labor market that is so much more sensitive to the skills of people. And in a way also better in extracting value from the skills that people have. Now translating better skills into better jobs and better lives now. One of the things that, you know, it's hard to believe, but actually we work a lot less than some decades ago. There's been a shift from work to leisure. But are we equipped for that? Do we use our free time well in, in ways that actually lead to greater life satisfaction? Questions we should ask ourselves. And then there comes the question of, you know, new forms of work. One thing is clear that digital platforms, you know, drive the reorganization of entire industries. No? You no longer know what is a big company and a small company. Very few employees, employees can change the world. No? You no longer know who is the customer and who is the business because peer-to-peer -peer markets are blurring those boundaries. No? And you know, when you look on the vertical axis, the skills of populations that we tested in our survey of adult skills and on the horizontal axis, the risk of automation, you can see how closely they are linked. The countries best protected from the risks of automations are the ones who are most highly skilled. That's the reality. That's our economies today. But you know, when we surveyed 15 year old students, you know, what do you want to do in your life? An amazing picture emerged. You know, some 30, 40, sometimes over 50% of young people, and actually even more so those from disadvantaged backgrounds, aspire to jobs, to precisely those jobs that are most at risk to be automated. It tells you we are educating young people not for their future, but for our past. We need to think harder about the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values that are required for tomorrow. And then look at digital tailorism, new forms of work. Look at the rise of online labor. What are the consequences for, you know, on the job learning and training if increasing numbers of workers no longer have a fixed employer who could sponsor, you know, their continued professional development? What does that shift mean for education system, for formal, for non-formal education and for educational professionals? Very important questions to ask. And then, of course, knowledge always means power. You know, a few decades ago, there were very small elites who, you know, determined what we would be reading. Think of the, you know, television anchors or the newspaper authors. Few people who thought about carefully what they would be writing, who curated the resources that we would all draw. If you didn't know the answer to a question, you could look it up in, encycl in an encyclopedia and you could trust that answer to be true. Today, we are all authors. Everybody contributes knowledge. Look at the rise in the number of wikis. If you don't know the answer to a question, you look it up in Google and nobody will tell you what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is not true. Literacy is no longer about you know, extracting knowledge, it's about constructing knowledge. Easy to say, but when you actually look at the navigation skills of 15-year-olds, you know, 
Can you distinguish fact from opinion? Can you triangulate different information sources? You can see a few countries here, Singapore, Korea, parts of China, but even in those countries, it's just about half of the 15 year olds who are really good at that. In many countries, a, a significant you know, majority of 15 year olds are not equipped for the digital world in which we live. No. To be born in the digital world doesn't mean you're a digital native. No. We have great technology, but so many people lack those skills to make sense out of this technology. No. And if you don't understand an algorithm, you're going to be soon the victim of that algorithm. No. And then, of course, there's the environment. No. Think about, you know, as you can see here, since 1917, our ecological footprint has consistently exceeded the Earth's biocapacity, no. which you can see here marked by the dotted line. In 2021, we exceeded it by over 70%, which means that globally we lived as if we had 1.7 planets available in, instead of just the one we have. No. And then, you know, if you're an American, you would have consumed as if there would be five Earth available. Clearly, that is not sustainable. How do we build that, those skills? Well, you know, when we ask school leaders, it turned out that they're very, very optimistic about this. You know, you can see here nine out of 10 school leaders in OECD countries say, yeah, you know, climate change and global warming is included in our curriculum. And by the way, also, you know, gender equality, conflicts, poverty, migration, everything that you cover in the SDGs. But the picture was different when we surveyed students. On the one hand, you can see, yeah, most young people told us looking after the global environment is really important to me. This agenda is important, it's urgent, it's personal for young people. But when we ask them, can you do something about it? Or do you think what you do is going to make a difference for people in other places? The bars got a lot shorter. That's the fundamental challenge of education today. We make young people passive consumers of prefabricated content. We do not give them that agency to mobilize their cognitive, social, emotional resources. No. So what can we do, particularly after this COVID pandemic? Maybe you can provide more flexible, more resilient education and training, particularly vocational education. We can certainly do better to use technologies. We can look more to the future and look for maybe future proof jobs. And certainly we need to enhance a broader range of knowledge, skills, attitudes and values. When you think about, you know, more flexible and resilient means for reskilling, we could allow for more training breaks, you know, more extensions, greater modularization, giving people more ownership over what they learn, how they learn, when they learn and where they learn. We can maybe move away from these long, lumpy programs, focusing more on fast track licensing, the recognition of prior learning, making learning more adaptable to the situations and needs of people. And as we have seen in the pandemic, sometimes sectors shift very rapidly. No. You couldn't fly an airplane, but technicians were very much needed in hospitals. No. Can we make our training more adaptive to pick people up where they are and provide them with the tools to get into those sectors where they're most needed? No. So those are questions we need to ask ourselves. Now, when you look at technology, you know, on the one hand, you know, te technology can enhance new learning experiences. No. Technology holds the promise also to bring learners to learn, uh, learning to learners in new ways. While you study mathematics on a computer, the computer can study how you study and then make your learning experience so much more granular, so much more adaptive, so much more personal. Now, learning analytics can give educators a better picture of how different learners learn differently and then engage with them in personalized ways. And you know, one of the biggest mistakes we probably made over the last decades is to divorce learning from assessment. We ask people to pile up lots and lots of learning. And then one day we ask them, you know, come back, tell me everything, you know, in a very constrained, contrived setting. And that then leads to the narrowing of teaching and the narrowing of learning. Well, the technology can help us reintegrate learning and assessment in new ways.
That's the great promise. And last but not least, you know, we can reconcile what is needed in our societies with the individual career aspirations. No? We can do better, a better job in forecasting those skills. No? For the short term, we can focus more on retraining for essential jobs. In the long term, we can focus more on those sectors that hold the greatest promise. And remember at the beginning of my presentation, we know a lot about the big trends that shape the future of education. And we can give young people and older people more guidance on how they move from where they are to the kind of opportunities that like to pursue. And last but not least, you know, we used to learn to do the work and now suddenly learning is the work. In the past, things were easy. You went to school, to a university, you got a job and then you retire. Today, we need to put greater emphasis on the earliest years. Some of the knowledge, skills, attitudes and values that are particularly important in the 21st century are best learned in the early years. Curiosity, courage, empathy, leadership. When we are older, they become personality traits. When we are children, you know, empathy is a skill like mathematics. And then, you know, tertiary education needs to much better integrate the world of work and the world of learning. And then, you know, great places of work will always be great places of learning. But there's some important questions that we need to ask, you know. Learning is much harder to organize. We need to answer tough questions of how to share the costs and benefits of lifelong learning between workers, companies, taxpayers. And we need to figure out how to set quality standards. The future here is with micro-credentials that again give people greater ownership over what they learn, how they learn, where they learn. What we do with people outside firms? For the unemployed, you can say, yeah, of course, you know, governments should pick up the bill and provide the training. But what about people at risk of losing their jobs? No? Who's going to take care of, you know, the truck drivers whose job might disappear over the next decade? No? How do we encourage, enable, support them to learn now for the next job? No? Or for people who want to change jobs? Or for people in the gig economy who do not have, you know, fixed employer? No? And then there are tricky governance questions involved. You know, new forms of work often mean that it's harder to tax people. No? And as the link between formal education and jobs is weakening, governments may have a harder time to keep track. No? You can summarize all of that, you know, as a race between education and technology. Before the great industrial revolution, you know, neither education nor technology made a big difference for the vast majority of people. But then came the Industrial Revolution, suddenly moving technology ahead of the skills of people. And people were so badly left behind. This Industrial Revolution caused so much social pain. But then eventually, you know, we built public schooling, we made people compatible with the norms of working of the Industrial Age and actually created generations of prosperity. But now we risk that we miss out on the digital revolution that once again, you know, is moving technology ahead of the skills of people. No? And you can see everywhere, we see that same kind of social pain. We see even university graduates sometimes having difficulties finding a good job. And at the same time, you know, employers tell you, we cannot find the people with the skills we need. No? So the question again is how do we move people once again ahead of the technologies of our times? What are the knowledge, skills, attitudes and values we need to develop? Those are the questions we need to strive to answer today. And I know in your program, you're going to work on those. Thank you very much. Appreciate that gift. Mr. Schlaffer, really a big resounding E plus plowing because you know he has laid down the challenge for education not just for today but also for the coming years. Uh, what I would like to how I would like to reiterate some of the key points that gives me sort of the the loudest wake up call is the 
the challenge confronting the education sector is actually a race between technology and education. So that, you know, how do we sort of revamp and update and modernize our education system structure, mechanisms, tools, and teachers in such a way that could actually with, with help uh, the, the challenge of time. Because compared to the industrialization process, it took longer for us to adjust to the change. And it is a, each generation of technology during the industrialization period takes also a longer lifespan. What is different fundamentally is the short, much shorter lifespan of technology, especially digital and ICT related technology over the last 20 years. Many, many young people who were born in this century have not seen, for example, an old traditional type manual typewriter and many other things that we oldies grew up with. So I think, you know, we need to start thinking not only individually, how to be agile and versatile and resilient. We also have to put those questions on the education system as a whole. And I think another point that I would like to stress, and I think that also highlights the philosophy and the fundamental value applied to the education is is Dr. Schleicher's statement about changing the role of students from passive consumers, but rather to be partners, to, to, to be co-producers of quality education through agency, through the learning experience and the journey itself, the young students would have the opportunity to also develop their own agency and to find their path forward so that their potential can be fully realized, regardless how difficult they would find the, the circumstances they were born into. I think most important thing in terms of education regarding its mission is to fulfill the promise that young people through learning and older adults or adults through learning could continuously find the password pathway forward, increasing in their social and economic mobility. And with that few words, I would like to, to invite Mr. Uh, Manos. Well, <laughs> Antoninis to give the next lecture. Uh, before that, I would uh, trouble Jean to roll back, you know, to just share a few findings that we have being able to get from participants from a, a pre-program uh, su uh, survey. And I think, you know, this is very interesting as a way to preface in the introduction of your input and contribution. First of all, the question is, how, how much has our current curriculum in view of the, the challenge and existential threat actually integrated sustainability sustainable development topics into the schooling. And you could see that 92% out of 24, which is not much, but it's give us a, a toll <laughs> in the water to know what's the circumstance, this current situation. Uh, however, most of the approach is not a total system approach. Only five cases out of the 22 are actually mentioned that integra integrated the uh, ES the ESD into you know, a larger span of the education structure. Next one, please. But how deep have they been able to delve into the topics and really integrate it in a more traditional way of dealing with specific disciplinary subject matter? Only about a quarter saying to a great extent. So you know, we have a lot more work to do. The next one, please. And so with these few words, I would like to open the floor to to welcome uh, Mr. Anton Ines to give his uh, lecture of the day. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Sanoyu, and uh, a pleasure to be here with you today for this uh, uh, executive's training on education and the SDGs. I'll share my screen. It would be, it would have been, of course, so much preferable to be with you uh, in person in order to be able to listen to your needs and your concerns, what you would like to know as you, uh, as you, uh, encounter the challenge of monitoring your, the progress of your countries and the relationship of sustainable de development goals with the development of your country. So I'm hoping, and I'm uh, please do confirm uh, if there is going to be some interaction at the end. Um, yes. uh, I'm on the card, good, great. So um, I'm actually going to be perhaps less lyrical, um, less future oriented, less perhaps developed country oriented in my presentation. I know you raised uh, your concern about a focus on, on some of the traditional indicators we have had to monitor progress in education, but as the data show, uh, the fact that many countries are so far behind what some of the rich countries consider their daily reality is of course uh, a cause for considerable concern. And especially given that our agenda and our timeline is 2030 uh, is not beyond that and we would all want to achieve the targets of SDG 4 by 2030 and yet we are far too far from achieving this so that's important to um, remind ourselves about that a quick word about uh, the report uh, that I'm directing it's uh, an editorial independent report that is hosted by UNESCO since uh, 2002, it's our 20th year anniversary. But in 2015, we received a global mandate to monitor progress on education in the SDGs. That's why we have a monitoring part that goes target by target and also uh, addresses finance issues and issues related to education and the other SDGs. But also, we have a mandate to monitor the implementation of the strategies that countries committed to achieve uh, mm. in the course of these 15 years. And that's why we have a theme that is selected by advisory board, international advisory board, with the objective to hold all partners to account. Here you see the themes of the last five uh, reports that covered many of the issues that you have already uh, referred to. And we have the high level political forum this year. And the, the big challenge is how do we report to countries on our progress? In 2019, when SDG 4 was last reviewed, we had a publication jointly with the UNESCO Institute for Statistics that actually focused on um, the quantitative progress. And I'm going to start with that. But as you said, I completely agree with you, the qualitative element is also extremely important. But how we do that is the question. So let's look at a few of the headline indicators and why it is still important to look at them before we look into the content, I mean. So we still have one in three young people out of school these days, young people of age uh, between, let's say, 15 and 17, who should be in school and yet they're not. And even worse, because many of those children who are in school at that age are actually over age. They started late, they repeated several grades. In fact, what we see is that currently, 85% of children complete pri primary school globally on time. Uh, there's an extra four or five percentage points to be added for children that might be completing primary school at age 17 or 18 around the world today. So still, in 2020, just before the pandemic struck, one in 10 children were not completing primary school, not secondary school. The percentage of completion is 72% for lower secondary and just over 50% for upper secondary. That is a major a fact to, to, uh, for all of us to remember as we go into discussions about higher level skills that are acquired at the university level. And on the learning, which is of course a, a major way uh, forward that we have achieved with the SDGs, we have been able to add uh, perhaps a very narrow, but still for the first time, measure of learning outcomes on reading and mathematics at three levels. And the data we have shows that 51% of students achieve a minimum 
level of proficiency in reading at the end of primary education. That means not being just able to read, but also to be able to comprehend and analyze uh, texts. And that, by the way, is not because uh, I think uh, OECD's assessments were presented as the benchmark. The OECD's assessments are not the benchmark of international education. In fact, OECD does not even monitor uh, education outcomes in primary education. It is a measure for children of age 15. And uh, PISA is one of several assessments that exist around the world. So there are um, assessments that pre-exist PISA from uh, the IEA, like, such as Pearls and Teams. There are regional assessments from Latin America uh, that UNESCO is leading from Western Africa or Francophone Africa uh, that uh, Confemen is leading. Uh, assessments in Southeast Asia uh, that is a, a collaboration between Simeo and, um, and UNICEF. Uh, there's also an assessment in the Pacific. A range of assessments around the world exist and UNESCO is helping um, put all those together and make them comparable. Uh, which uh, uh, is, of course, uh, not an easy task. But these statistics tell us that one in two children actually uh, achieve the minimum that one would expect of a child. And that's only for the, those children that do reach it, the end of uh, primary education. Other statistics tell us that one in four children do not attend preschool the year before they're supposed to enter uh, the first grade. We also know that one in three countries spend below both international benchmarks that were uh, agreed in 2015. That means both than 4% of GDP and less than 15% of uh, their budgets. Perhaps it's not a surprise to see then that one in five primary education teachers globally are not trained according to national standards, the standards that countries themselves have set. And equity, which is of course the main uh, contribution uh, alongside uh, learning outcomes of this new agenda, shows us that uh, while we might have some slight gender disparity in secondary completion on average, we have huge differences between countries. Some of the poorer countries have large disparities at the expense of girls. Richer countries have large and growing disparities at the expense of boys. But one statistic to take home, remember, only 1% of the poorest girls in low-income countries complete secondary education. So before we talk about some of the challenges of the transformation of our economies, let's not forget that there is also a right to education, and that right is not respected around the world because there are millions of children that uh, do not benefit from the lowest possible fulfillment and respect of that right. Now, I mentioned some statistics together. Uh, I said that uh, you see 51% of children uh, achieve minimum proficiency in, uh, at the end of primary education, but when you consider that many of those children do not reach the end of, of, of primary education or uh, do not reach the end of lower secondary education, where also about half of the children achieve minimum proficiency, you see that the percentage of children and adolescents, regardless of whether in school or not, who achieve this minimum proficiency is much lower than what the headline statistics tells us. And in the extreme case of Sub-Saharan Africa, where uh, only one in four uh, young people complete lower secondary school. Of those, many do not actually achieve the minimum proficiency, and therefore only one in 10 young people achieve uh, the objective of SDG 4 to complete lower secondary school in time and come out of school with the minimum skills, not the advanced skills, the minimum skills that are required. And of course, we had COVID-19 between March 2020, because all these statistics refer to the period just before COVID started, between March 2020 and October 2021, uh, schools were closed fully or partially for 55% of the days. As this graph shows, uh, the conditions between countries vary enormously. You have countries where schools did not close at all, and schools, countries where schools were remained closed throughout this period of a year and a half. They have been longest in many countries in Latin America. Western Asia and Southern Asia, shortest in Oceania and in uh, some Sub-Saharan African countries, in many Sub-Saharan African countries. Now, the combination of uh, this variation in school closures, duration of school closures, and the fact that uh, about almost half a billion children did not have an opportunity for learning continuity means that in practice, learning losses are not a, a concern for 
all children around the world. If you look at the poorest countries, learning levels were already very, very low. The main challenge is there how to improve these learning levels. In richest countries, we have the case of uh, you know, good resources and children being able to continue their learning by distance. And also many countries actually not closing their schools for too long. But the big problem is middle income countries where we know that on average schools remain closed for longer. And where we also know that children had less opportunity to continue their learning. And you see this graph comparing uh, the most basic skill, children of grades uh, between one and eight being able to read a text of the level of difficulty of grade two, uh, very, very basic. And you see that between 2018 and 2020, there was a, a considerable uh, decline. However, and that affected primarily children of grade four and five. You see at older ages, it doesn't affect them very much because already they had reached the maximum potential, let's say, which already is quite low in many cases, if you see, if you consider. But it means that there is a potential grave risk of uh, learning outcomes uh, reversing in middle income countries. And also that means that uh, we need to observe very closely the long-term consequences of that. We don't know yet whether it was a one-off or whether there will be uh, consequences continuing into the future. Now, what does it mean to evaluate progress today? Well, what we're trying to do uh, from uh, the education sector, and that's an important uh, message for all of you attending today, is that, of course, we set uh, targets that are to be achieved by all countries and all, all learners, 100%, but we know that this is not realistic given some of the figures that I just mentioned. What is very important for accountability purposes is for countries to set explicitly the targets they are planning to achieve by 2025 and 2030. This is a process that we're currently leading, the Global Education Monitoring Report together with the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. Uh, we have set uh, jointly with countries uh, seven of the SDG4 indicators that can be benchmarked. And essentially we're trying to bring to education the approach that has been used in climate change, the nationally determined contribution, what each country is prepared to contribute to achieve the global agenda, which might not be the 100%, but it will be important to know what it is that they're contributing so that we can link national, regional and global agendas. We had the publication uh, early this year that reported on the progress of this process. As you see, by the end of last year, about two in three countries participated submitting benchmarks, some directly, some through the regional uh, benchmarking framework in uh, Europe and in the Caribbean, and now some are still working to submit them. And we are inviting currently the remaining countries to provide uh, their benchmarks so that we can report at the high level political forum. And that will be a major change to the way we have been uh, monitoring progress because it, it is based on the benchmarks that countries themselves set on their own initiative and as a result of the commitment they made in 2015. Now, of course, quantitative is one aspect. The, the, the other important aspect is the qualitative aspect. What are the policies that countries are bringing to fulfill the vision of the SDGs? In 2019, we had a companion publication that we presented to the High Level Political Forum, which was called Beyond Commitments, which is uh, not just the benchmarks that are quantitative, but what are countries doing? What are the policies for which they feel proud that are contributing to the uh, vision of SS the SDGs? And there are various uh, ways to classify those, uh, the extent to which countries focus on equity, the extent to which they uh, amend the content for uh, sustainable development, which is precisely what you're interested in, the extent to which they bring sectors to collaborate, the extent to which uh, they focus on learning and not just on uh, filling seats in classrooms, the extent to which uh, they see learning beyond schools uh, for uh, adults, and also the extent to which they uh, work with each other, uh, which is also an important message of the agenda. Now we could talk, and I'm happy to answer to questions uh, um, by the audience, but uh, because specifically uh, you asked me about education for sustainable development, there is indeed an implementation framework that was agreed by member states through uh, UNESCO, and it has five priority areas, how to advance policy, uh, how to, in, 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 essentially to in, integrate content that is linked to sustainable de development in, in the policy through guidelines. What is the way to learn more from each other through peer learning? 
how are we developing the capacity of educators uh, to teach these elements? How can we engage youth, our target audience, for the future, hope for the future through communication and advocacy activities? And how to engage each one of us to monitor trends? Now, from uh, the perspective of the Global Education Monitoring Report, the big question here is how prepared are countries to enable a mechanism for monitoring and reporting education for sustainable development that is not uh, as currently is self-reported by the countries. Uh, the big challenge is to enable some independent experts advice and monitoring on what countries are doing because often countries are trying very hard to uh, show that they're doing well but in the process we don't learn the lessons of how we can do uh, this more complicated aspect of uh, education better uh, because we need to be open and we need to be able to listen to what others might be uh, having to say on that so i'll stop here um, and i would like to leave that open for uh, comments uh, for all of you who are coming from different fields not necessarily from education and i would like to hear what you associate with education how would you like to see education reviewed in a uh, in a context and a global forum like the um, uh, high level political forum so I see there are some questions coming, but I'll stop my presentation here and uh, I'm happy to hear uh, your feedback. Uh, you're, uh, you're mute again. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, you. Mr. Anton Nines. Uh, it is a very useful contribution to our discussion and also broaden the perspective looking at education from a very diverse context and also wide spectrum in terms of what's being achieved and what could be achieved and what yet to be done. Uh, I, you know, I just wanted to follow up your, with your last uh, uh, input considering this framework for uh, ESD. Uh, you, there are five different priority areas. From your observation of uh, in the countries and also your own uh, in-depth or deep experience by directing this global education monitor, where do you consider to be a possible first step for countries to, to actually start? Uh, the last one, the community could play a very important role in terms of co-contributing to the monitoring of education that I think we agree, but it's yet to have better understanding how to implement. So I wonder what's your, what's your comment on that? Why are we looking and collecting uh, questions from the, from the, from the audience? So, um, I could say, I could start, I think I could combine perhaps your question with uh, uh, one question that's coming from Ida. Uh, Mantle, uh, which is, I think, linked. What is a good example of how to do non-governmental assessments? Well, we have target 4.7 uh, in, uh, in the SDGs, in the SDG 4, and that is a target that is actually um, reviewing how countries are introducing elements of sustainable development and global citizenship, which, of course, are overlapping yeah. to a considerable uh, degree in their education policies, uh, in their uh, uh, curricula, in the teacher education programs and in the assessment. And currently countries are report self-reporting. There's a process uh, within UNESCO, in fact, it is uh, the 1974 recommendation that countries agreed uh, on education for international understanding, peace and human rights. Uh, but when they do report, in the, uh, when they self-report, it's hard for uh, some of the more difficult messages to be conveyed. Mm. Uh, we had, for instance, uh, in the first report in the cycle, we had commissioned expert studies of textbooks, which are, of course, not identical to the curricula, but is an essential element. It's the me mechanisms through which text, uh, through the, which curricula are communicated. And that showed how particular elements, particular components of uh, uh, educational sustainable development were reflected. We saw how they increase over time, mm. but we also saw the large percentage of countries that we're not including those. And yeah. that is a kind of information 
that uh, you know countries are not going to admit or report yeah. or being able to compare. And that's only the most objective part. There's also the more subjective and difficult parts. Education for international understanding, of course, contains uh, needs to include an, a discussion of elements that are quite difficult about coexistence, about um, solidarity. And these are, of course, very difficult uh, for countries to self-report. You need uh, some expert advice to uh, say, OK, countries could do better on that front. Um, but we know that education in general is a national prerogative. And that's a big challenge we're all facing. We would like, looking from the outside, uh, countries to be doing more things in certain directions. In reality, no country wants to be told how its education system is going to be uh, formulated. And that's the big challenge that we are facing as an international community, where we have lofty ideals for certain concepts, but at the end, we don't have uh, the, the right, let's say, framework to engage countries. So that's where, that's what is needed. Uh, peer learning opportunities need to be emphasized. Uh, and how one does that, it's a good question. It may be very difficult to do that at a global level. Uh, that's a line that we have been advocating for a long time. Uh, regional contexts might be more appropriate. We know that some regions uh, are more likely to find uh, ways to sit down and discuss with each other. Uh, other regions may find it difficult, but at the global level, we are quite constrained in the extent to which we can initiate such discussions. Well, thank you for your very uh, <coughs> lengthy discuss. I mean, elaboration. I assume that we will be able to find the studies on the uh, UNESCO website. Uh, and then if you can also uh, kindly put it down uh, sort of uh, in the chat, so for for people to get uh, easy access. There's one more question, but in view of time that I won't uh, raise here because we have five more speakers uh, after your you know, your contribution. So I would uh, just read out the question and uh, and request your your comment in the chat to the to the, the person who asked the question. The question is how how come there is there aren't more qualitative data. Why are they missing? And I think it is from your work, and I know how difficult it is. So you have a lot to say. So I don't don't dare to venture to open the floor to that to, for you to address that. But I think you know what you just said has already allowed us to have a glimpse uh, in terms of uh, uh, why it is difficult to have more qualitative data. And this also serves as a good way to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Raymond Sanner. He's going to look at SDG 4 and the attainment of education of quality education for all from a different, uh, uh, you know, from a sort of holistic perspective and also propose some ideas in terms of how to improve uh, quality of learning, especially addressing the link of pres uh, present to the future learning to the to to the to the work uh, and also uh, learning to in terms of personal individual uh, agency. So the floor is yours and uh, the information of uh, Raymond Sanner is that uh, he is a, a tutelar professor from the Basel University and also being a co-founder for Center for Socioeconomic Development. Currently, he works a lot on the, the public, private and uh, uh, partnership and also on the other thing, other issues related to uh, to gender and to especially about monitoring of SDG progress. So the floor is yours, uh, Raymond Sanna. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can upload my uh, slides. Can you see them? Yeah. Okay, I'll make them larger. Right. And I know that uh, you had a, a very extensive preparation, so I would uh, just uh, remind you at the 15 minutes, uh, <laughs> two minutes before 15, uh, <laughs> that is no, your time. I know. Well, I hope that there are long and short 15 minutes, but anyhow, just wanted to say it was a great uh, start. Uh, I enjoyed the two presentations by Andreas and uh, Manos. To me, they were complimentary, uh, exciting, uh, 
information and I hope with both of them together and all the information they shared with us, there is something we can do to improve the situation that as Manos just showed us uh, is not that as good as it could be. So my focus is more uh, from an additional uh, a bit civil society perspective, non-state actor perspective, what could be done about education and how does this all fit with the SDG 4? So uh, I will uh, look at uh, the uh, partnership uh, component, the 17, the SDG 17, and I want also to put education into a larger picture and to see how does this relate that the mat meta, macro, meso and micro levels, and I will explain what that means shortly. <clears throat> and my focus is also to look at quality. How could we improve quality? Even though maybe uh, the resources and conditions are not uh, very um, helpful, but there are things that can be done. <clears throat> and I also would like to bring to the picture and to our discussion, some things could be beneficial across borders if we share not just only peer learning, but let's say also by participation, engaging with each other to uh, uh, provide educational services. Well, you've seen this picture for quite some time. Let me move on and just to emphasize this slide here um, gives a very good summary of at the outside, the third ring, you have all the SDGs and then they're clustered based on, for instance, which ones of them uh, focus on basic needs, satisfaction of basic needs. Which of these SDGs empower people or are meant to empower people to improve their lives? How much is climate change oriented? How much is nat natural capital, earth, oceans oriented? And how much is also how to govern, how to organize in, in institutionally and internationally, how we could make sure that we have more peace and much less war? So quality education is part of empowering people. Uh, and today I would say also to go back to what Andreas emphasized at the end, of course, it's no longer uh, the, the perspective that we go to school, learn, go to work, and that's it. The lifelong learning is a must. And how could we think of a quality education on a more lifelong basis? Now, this slide here <coughs> goes back to a first publication by David Leblanc, who is also with UNDESA, who put to us the perspective that all these goals interact. They're linked with each other, some very strongly, others to some extent, some are even maybe uh, trade-offs. But I have here emphasized education, and you could see um, I drew a few lines how education could be linked to technical vocational skills, how uh, doing good, meaning doing very good technical and vocational skills, of course, also means that growth, economic growth, uh, and including social growth could be improved. And you see another one uh, of the arrows go about gender disparities. We heard about the girls being uh, much less privileged to learn or, or cannot finish school. If we eliminate or try to elim eliminate this discrimination, of course, it then also leads to less inequality. And less inequality means the girls and later on women can, can contribute more effectively to growth. And in that sense, society can benefit from it. So now about the four levels. I like to put education into a larger context. As you see here, I'm putting it into the meta, macro, meso, and micro level. At the very top is what we have internationally, the education that's available in the developed countries and in the less developed countries. How do our universities uh, uh, link with each other? How do they share knowledge when they create knowledge? And then macro level is more about the country level, the national level, what kind of laws do we have? And we just heard uh, from um, uh, Manos. <laughs> so many of our countries think that's their sovereign right to do whatever they do, on, including 
to do nothing what they should do in terms of reporting what's happening in terms of education. Meso level is more the educational sector and micro level could be in enterprises or the lifelong learning aspects. So just briefly, meta level, the international component of education is uh, oftentimes not as sufficiently um, discussed, yeah, but we can sometimes see how the larger universities open up campuses in other countries, or they have joint research projects, or they exchange faculty from one continent to the other. The, the, the dynamism of knowledge creation means a, most of it is also cross-border cooperation. Macro level, the national laws. Well, if we want to change anything or improve education, of course, we should also take into account what kind of policy exists in our country. What kind of de economic development policy do we have where one component, of course, is crucial, and that's the uh, human resources, the uh, knowledge, the capital uh, of, of people who later on um, after education move into the labor market. What are the budgets that our governments make available? We, have, we just heard before that some of the countries have uh, put uh, only um, uh, budgets that are minus or below 4% uh, of GDP. Others are going beyond that. There are very different uh, financial commitments. And of course, financial commitments are also based on what a country has that it could invest in terms of money, invest in an educational policy or budget. Meso level, very important, also oftentimes not discussed. What are in our countries the relationships and also the power of the teachers' unions? How much do they limit experimentation or innovation? How much ideological positions are taken by our governments or the different political parties? Uh, what, what are their positions? How, do, how could we get them on board, so to speak, to help improve quality of education uh, in, in, in cooperation with these different stakeholders that we have in our countries. And finally, within a company, within an enterprise, of course, we also have to think about what kind of education is being made available. Is it uh, apprenticeship based? Is it just a few formal moments of a few days of training? Is what they offer in terms of training also linked to the company's performance to, uh, or is it treated as if it were to be a standalone training experience? Now, the financing. <clears throat> uh, well, we have here uh, a few comments that I would like to uh, share with you. An IMF study by Vito Gaspar and his colleagues, just estimating how much money we need to invest just for the SDGs as such, all of them, in including SDG 4. And the estimation is it will be at least 0.5% of the global GDP, meaning in, in dollars, 2.1 trillion, for, particularly also for the emerging economies. Now, investing in education, not only, of course, public goods means education, health, roads, electricity, water, and sanitation. There are an estimate or the suggestion here is should be about 4% of GDP of a country. However, when we look at the least developed countries, their uh, financing, the, the, the amount of money they would have to put, uh, make available to just implement the SDGs is staggering. The estimation by our IMF colleagues is 15% of their GDP of these LDCs would have to be made available to finance the uh, SDGs, which of course I think all, all of you uh, would agree it's it's impossible for them, especially for those uh, who are highly indebted. So uh, the question is how to finance education. Should it be through tax uh, tax increases? Uh, our, <laughs> our colleagues from IMF normally in general are more. Uh, known to propose tax reductions. However, here they, I think they joined the large majority saying the, the SDGs require financial resources. 
it's not going to drop down from heaven. We have to figure out where to get these financial resources and then invest them smartly. Uh, so some of that is also a, me a measure of simply our countries to be able to collect taxes, make their taxes as much as equitable and fair as possible. But for the financing of SDGs, including education, we need to find money to finance education. Now, there are sometimes discussions about who should do the job, meaning who should organize education and also pay for it. You have on this left side here uh, the assumption that everything could be done by the government. Hence, of course, as I said just before, it means the government collects tax taxes in order to have a budget in order to finance and organize education. If that's not the case, there are other options that are sometimes being discussed to do it through uh, procurement, to do it through PPPs, or even to privatize education, which is uh, very controversial, but happens in some of our countries. So if it is a PPP solution, we should not forget PPPs are time limited, but most of the time they go beyond a generation. In other words, maybe 20, 30 years, there is an arrangement found, and at a certain time, the money has to be paid back to the private sector, which is uh, being invited to invest in education. That means the young generation of today will have to pay up. Hence, uh, we think it would be f just simply fair to get a way to involve also the, uh, the younger generation in our setting of investment targets. And that includes also education. Are they in agreement or not? Do they see the, um, the, the need for improving quality of education as well as access to education? Now, some things could be done through, as I said before, through international cooperation. And a lot of that is also has a commercial uh, component to it, which makes it a, a very controversial proposal. But let me say a few more things. There are countries that are so-called educational exporters and particularly more Anglo-Saxon countries. But if you see here the slide of Australia, 11.8% at that time of when this statistics was uh, developed, 11.8% uh, uh, of all its services that it exports, it could also be financing, uh, insurance or whatever, but 11.8% were generated through their in universities who offered education in other countries. Then we had Canada, US, United States, but also some you know, European countries are involved in offering education in other countries, but also that includes here the concept is offering education to foreign students who come to, let's say, France or Germany to take uh, uh, education. There are uh, points for or against the idea to have more of a partially private sector commercial involvement in education. On one hand, you have those who are more in favor of liberal liberalizing, saying that through competition, through also private schools, there is more uh, new ideas that pop up because they all try to outdo the competitor and attract more students. On the protecting and less um, uh, liberalizing perspective, there are also valuable, va valid uh, concerns that by inviting private investors or let's say private universities to open office and a campus in, in other countries, it might contradict the laws that are in place and it might lead to conflicts with the uh, public universities that are in place. So the, uh, uh, protect, the, the, uh, the protecting side, those who are against more participation or involvement of private universities from abroad. There's also a perception that this is against the idea of public service. It will eat away uh, some of the resources and because private sector uh, um, uh, universities uh, are expensive, it will attract more of the well-to-do families of the upper part of the society. And hence it would in a way contradict the goal of education, which will be to be more inclusive 
and more integrating rather than dividing the, the, the kids uh, into the more wealthy and the less wealthy who go to different uh, universities. Yeah, now, I'd like to give you, minutes. Yeah, I'd like to give you an example of, um, of Shanghai. Shanghai, of course, as we all know, is a big uh, country. <clears throat> big city. And, and, and a big city, and they need also to improve education, which are, have been busy for quite some time. So they allow, for instance, Australian universities, public or private universities from Australia, to open campuses in Shanghai, but they set conditions. For instance, about what the tuition fees is that they could ask of Chinese students. They also set, uh, give clear indications where they could set up the campus, what kind of degrees they could offer. And oftentimes they also insist that the Australian university would allow the good students to then go to Australia to continue with higher education, even up to a PhD with maybe possibilities to enter the labor market in Australia. So there is a consideration about a, a strategy, how to use potentially the university or the educational market in the favor of a strategy, which the country and the city has set. They, wa they want to improve educational competence uh, of, their, uh, um, of their students. So the other part is what can companies do in terms of SDG implementation? You have here an example, uh, a the fictitious example of a food company. From beginning to the end, this is their manufacturing process where they uh, buy in the ingredients, which they then manufacture or process to uh, products that they sell in the market transportation to the market, selling them uh, the products and at the end to discard um, the waste that has been produced through this production process. Each step means also uh, a potentially use of efforts to uh, make the best possible orientation of their pro uh, um, processing steps in light of positive, here is the, the uh, indication positive, a positive use of, for instance, for education to contribute to the know-how of their own people working in the company to give them additional training, to give them supervision and mentoring. In that sense, not just simply to poach people from the labor market, but to give and provide uh, education to improve their knowledge and also in that sense, of course, improve the performance of the company. You have here more indication what it means for a company if a company wants to reconsider how it uses education or uh, um, training. Finally, just to conclude, when we do training, in-service training in companies, oftentimes people don't think through it and do not really see the need for evaluation. Was it good? Was it a waste of time? Was it a waste of money? It should be, in terms of quality, it should be somewhat predictable. It should have a consistency, right? And at the final end, it should be linked. It should be linked to a purpose. In-service training shouldn't be a standalone uh, training activity, it should also help the company as well as the person who's taking a training. But we found through research in different companies that this is not necessarily so. And, and oftentimes training is unfortunately a wasted uh, resource that doesn't generate much benefit, neither for the employee nor for the company. And this gets me to say, let's think of 17. 17 is the SDG for partnerships. If we go to 1716, target 16, it indicates we should mobilize and share knowledge, expertise, and technology. Let's do more of that and do it together between North and South, East and West, and engage different forms of doing education together, producing education, not only uh, evaluating, but to produce particularly for those countries that have 
few financial resources, nor access to uh, the, the quality of teacher or teacher uh, education that the developed countries have. So this gets me to the end. I'm sorry if I have uh, gone beyond my time limit, but let's all surf along and reach new grounds uh, as our has been already uh, outlined in a way by both Andreas and Manos, face the challenges and let's move everybody together into a better future. Thank you. Well, thank you, Raymond. I know that you have more to say and also I think <laughs> need to be said. And I'm glad that you brought in the resource question and link it to the performance of education system. And I think that's really the challenge to keep to keep on sort of mobilizing resources without getting, you know, the, the, the sort of the desired outcome at the macro level uh, will be not sustainable. And I think that the picture that you mentioned from the study by the IMF mentioning that most countries now spending 4% of their total budget on education and what is necessary if we want to see education as a strong instrument to implement the SDGs, then it requires 15%. So where would be this 12, this extra additional 11% will come from? You proposed, you know, the adoption of technology, uh, partnership, and also other means. And I think, I think, you know, we need to sort of take more seriously when we do this SDG uh, review and, and see the, the linkage between the, the work how the work gets done and how to do it and how to create the necessary benefit with the resource question. Because we know one of the findings from all the studies, including UNESCO uh, and OECD, is that teacher, the working condition of teachers are in such a way makes the, the, the slogan or the objective of quality education for all almost forgettable. So I think you know we we really have to uh, take seriously the resource utilization question uh, better. And with these few words, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Mr. Eric uh, Swas. He's the head of the international affair for the Swiss Federal uh, University on vocational education and training. We shouldn't forget that one of you know not all students would have the opportunity nor the apt aptitude to go to university. So a lot of them are actually leaving the formal school system at age of 16, if they reach that. Uh, therefore, or even before, so how do we create the necessary bridges between the education system the, and the working, the, the place of work and facilitating, ensuring the learning continues to happen? So that indeed the the idea of a lifelong lifelong learning journey it is reality, not just something we talk about in a book. So, and Eric has been working on in his current job since 2012, if I'm not uh, making a mistake, and has been engaged in many ways uh, international cooperation. So he will give us a talk, a, pre a presentation about the Swiss approach to linking the vocational techno, uh, technical education through a dual track system and how does the education system's own permeability supports the lifelong learning and continued individual development. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I apologize to the, to the audience that uh, I'm skipping the question and please address your question in the chat so we will ask the panelists to answer them. Thank you very much, Isha. I hope you see my uh, screen with the presentation. Um, so it's a great pleasure also for me to be here with you today for this um, executive uh, training. Could you make it uh, in, uh, in terms of slideshow so it's bigger? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. As it was said, I do work for the, the Swiss Federal University for um, Vocational Education and Training which is actually the, the, the experts organization in Switzerland. 
uh, for the further development of vocational education and training. It is public and under the roof of the Ministry of um, Education. And our focus is the training of teachers. Um, so the pedagogical training, it's about research. Um, it's about the development of uh, professions um, and also about international cooperation. And I'm happy to share with you the Swiss experience um, yeah, of the, the dual system of vocational education and training. Maybe just before, uh, just a few words about the context about Switzerland, which is um, yeah, quite a small country with 8.6 million uh, inhabitants. Um, but on the other side, uh, also a lot of diversity. So there are four national languages and also yeah, three or four different cultural um, regions. You see it here, the German speaking part, which is the biggest French speaking, Italian and Italian speaking as the main uh, cultural regions. And then when it comes to education, you see also already within this small country, also some kind of differences when it comes to the acceptance or the reputation of um, vocational education and training. Yeah, it's one confederation and there are 26 uh, regional authorities. So um, we call it the, the cantons. Um, and when it comes to uh, general education, primary school, secondary education, this is uh, managed by actually the, the cantons. And then when it comes to vocational education and training, it is actually a partnership uh, here between uh, the confederations, so the national context and the regional um, authority. Um, yeah, you see it here, the backbone of uh, the economy of Switzerland are the small and medium enterprises. Um, so below 250 uh, employees. So about, yeah, more than 99% of all the, the companies in Switzerland are small and medium um, enterprises. So let's talk about the, the education system. You see here in, in an overview. Um, yeah, the, the young people, the pupils, they go 11 years to um, compulsory school with two years uh, preschool included. And then, yeah, when they are 15, 16 years old, um, so they yeah, can choose the, the pathway. Uh, they have the two options going to general education, so to high school, or here on the left side, uh, choose the pathway of vocational education and training. Um, so this is uh, on the upper secondary level. And then uh, on the tertiary level, there is uh, the, the higher education, so we see classical universities, University of Applied Sciences, but then which is, which is quite, yeah, also unique um, in Switzerland is that on a tertiary level as well, there is um, the pathway of the professional education and training. So, um, yeah, it's actually the higher, higher vocational education and training. So let's, let's focus here on this uh, vocational education and training part. Actually in Switzerland, about two thirds of the young people, when they come out from compulsory school, they go into uh, the vocational education and training. So two thirds, the majority. Um, they take part in these programs, which last between two and uh, four years. And they can choose uh, of, among about 245 different um, professions. And you see it here, most of these programs in VET um, are conducted in a, in a dual track way. So um, uh, together with uh, the companies. So here we call, we talk about the uh, apprenticeship and only 10% of these programs are um, school-based. 
Yeah, on this slide, uh, we don't want to go in details here, but here it's all about um, the, the permeability of the system. As you, um, as you heard, about two thirds of the young people, they choose this pathway of vocational education and training. And uh, yeah, you can say that VET in Switzerland has quite a strong reputation, uh, strong acceptance in the society. So it's not a, a second choice uh, pathway. And one reason for that is also um, the, the permeability. So you can um, start here with a two years program or a three or four years program here. And then you always have um, the possibility to continue your education. So you have direct access then with the federal diploma of VET to go in a, into a tertiary level and to con continue your uh, education here. On the other side, you also have the possibility via this uh, federal vocational baccalaureate, which is a one year program based focused on general education. Um, you can have direct access to the U University of Applied um, Sciences. And via an aptitude test, you can also go to the university. So even if it's, yeah, it's quite rare in Switzerland, but it's possible that you can start here with a two years program, a certificate, and then along your, your education life, your professional life, you can end with a, a PhD at the, um, at the university. So this is one, one important, actually one important element of um, this education system in Switzerland. And this is the, yeah, it's the current marketing campaign of the, the Ministry of Education to show the young people that you can start on a initial VET training. So train as a hairdresser and then always continue your way to, to become a biologist and, and have a diploma on a tertiary level. I, mean, I mentioned before that there are about 245 um, occupations in Switzerland. And you see here the 10 most frequently chosen professions. And you see also here that it's not the, the blue color worker. Um, so we, that's also the reason why we don't talk about the technical vocation ed education and training, but uh, VET in general. You see here the the yeah the most popular is actually the commercial uh, employee that is chosen by by the young people. Yeah, how how does it work actually? So I mentioned these two years and and three or four years programs, um, and the dual track system actually. So it's combining practice and uh, theory. So the young um, people, when they are leaving compulsory school, so they had to apply actually to, uh, to a company. So they had to write their CV, um, then they got interviews. And um, so it's, it's really a, as a normal, uh, normal position. And then they get hired by, by a company for, with a training contract. So they spend three to four days per week in the host company and they will get trained there. So they have a contract with this host company. Then on the other side, there is uh, the theory. So one to two days per week, the apprentices, they spend uh, at the vocational school where they get uh, classroom instruction on vocational subjects. So linked to the profession, but also uh, general education. And last but not least, we, we talk about the dual track, but actually in Switzerland, we have the three uh, learning locations. We also have the branch courses where the apprentices from different companies, they, they are coming together to, to get a training there uh, specific to the, to the, for the whole branch, actually. So what are the, the key features or how does it work? As I uh, mentioned, the apprentices they have to have a contract with with the company so without having a contract with the company they can't cannot start uh, their vocational education and training 
Therefore, they, they get a small uh, salary from, from the company, which uh, it depends a little bit uh, on the professions, on the year, but you can say in the first year, maybe it's about 12, 13% of, uh, of a normal salary of, uh, of a loan, uh, loan worker. Um, yeah, then of course, the, the, the capacity building of the teachers is also um, very important. Based on the situation approach, uh, we, we apply here in Switzerland. Um, yeah, and what is also important here that the, the apprentice actually in the company, um, they, they are trained, but they are always um, rapidly integrated in the, in the process, in the production process or the commercial process. So after, depending on the profession, after one, two years, they really work on real products and with real clients. Yeah. That's it here. I'm going detail here. Okay, so yeah, Professor Salo mentioned already the, the public private partnership. And in Switzerland, when it comes to, to weight vocation, education and training, actually, this is the, the basics. It's all based on public private partnership. So it's a collaboration between the confederation, the private sector and the canton. And this actually is also uh, the first article in, in the law of vocation, education and training. Yeah, the confederation is responsible for the, the whole strategic management and they uh, approve also the, the competence qualification profiles for each uh, profession. So nation, these are nationwide uh, diploma. The regional authorities, so the cantons, they run the vocational schools um, and they run also the career guidance office to support the young people uh, in their choice of the profession and of their career pathway. And last but not least, actually, which is the most important partner here, these are the professional organizations. So it's the business, the, the companies. And they actually, in Switzerland, they define the training com content. So they define the uh, qualification profiles for each profession. And that's also why we can say the competences of the apprentices at the end of their apprenticeship, um, yeah, they correspond very well uh, to the needs of the labor markets. Because it's not the, the ministry, they define it, it's really uh, the business, they have the lead in defining the training. Okay, and it's really, um, yeah, it's an apprenticeship apprenticeship market. So the, uh, the confederation, the Swiss government, normally does not intervene in this market. So it's really um, demand and supply. So the companies, they offer a training apprenticeship position, and then there is uh, the, a demand of the use for this apprenticeship position. And in the last year, uh, even within uh, in the, the COVID crisis, during the COVID crisis, uh, the market was quite well balanced. And there have been even more um, apprenticeship positions than demand of the use. And of course, also here, it's a win-win-win situation. So you see here the different um, uh, advantages for, for the stakeholders. Um, for the for the companies, uh, for the confederation, and of course also for the for the young people, and maybe because it was mentioned also before for the companies, of course there are different reasons why they train these young people, why they even pay a salary um, for them. You see it here, um, and the last one is about the financial advantages. So there have been some studies here in Switzerland that even for the companies who train uh, the young people who pay the salaries, at the end, um, it is financially beneficial for them. So, 
Yeah, actually, they earn money while training these these young people because they pay the salary, but at the end, uh, the apprentices are integrated in the production process. So they, uh, yeah, they work on real products and real services. So there, okay. And then maybe to, to um, summarize. The yeah, great, minutes. two more minutes. Yeah, exactly. I have my clock here, thank you. <laughs> Um, to summarize the key elements of, of VET in Switzerland, so what I try to show is that the vocation education and training uh, is fully integrated in the Swiss education system, and it's not a, a second choice. Um, so it's a start to in the labor market or also to continue your, your education. Um, yeah, the probability also, uh, um, I tried to show you that there is no dead end in the system. There's always a possibility um, to continue your education. Yeah, it's a public-private partnership and uh, therefore also um, yeah, a strong um, orientation on the labor market. And yeah, last but not least, also the, the cost efficiency, as I, I mentioned uh, before, that for the companies, it is um, mostly financially beneficial to train um, apprentices. And um, yeah, we are also um, active in international cooperation because Professor Sano mentioned it um, before. And of course, uh, you see here the system how it works in Switzerland, but of course you can't, uh, you cannot copy paste uh, one one system. And the the approach in in the cooperation projects where we are active is always, um, yeah, to add, to maybe to choose some elements to adapt this to the local context, and then also to have a kind of a train the trainers approach that um, actually the the knowledge the know how is already then uh, in the respective countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eric, for, for this uh, presentation about the unique case of Switzerland, because <coughs> it often times people have similar chat, I mean, questions like in the chat. Excuse me. It's why young students want to go through apprenticeship track. <coughs> what did the government do? And what has companies do to entice them up? <coughs> Your last slide showed some of the answers, but would you want mind just elaborate a little bit more how would a young student be first introduced through career guidance, the possibility of pursuing apprenticeship study as the first step to their career development? Yeah, so. Um, okay, um, so in Switzerland, we have actually um, between 10 and 12 years, there is a how is it called the future day? Um, so where the the young pupils they can visit the uh, working place of their parents or also uh, of other companies. So this is a little bit the first uh, step to to go to feel a little bit uh, how is it in the world of of work. Um, and then after that at school, so already two years before the end of compulsory school. There are these uh, representatives of the career guidance offices. They are coming also to the classes um, to explain what are the possibilities in general education, but also vocational ed education and training. Um, and then on, on top of that, there is also, of course, a possibility to have uh, individual um, guidance. But uh, we also have to say that the role of the parents in this context is also uh, very important. Thank you.
Well, thanks. Uh, <coughs> in the chat, there's a question uh, from Romadani, uh, Mari Jani, uh, about the literature. If you can put that in into the chat for everybody, that will be very useful because I think this is one way of dealing with resource shortage. Uh, and this another way is to build collaborative of effort at the country level to for using education as a main driver for development. And I think, you know, if we look back in terms of the Swiss history, the apprenticeship model probably played a very major role uh, since uh, 1848. <laughs> if I may, if I may sort of vouch that. Uh, I have one more small questions and ask, it's a difficult one and ask for a short reply. Uh, it is uh, from Ida Menton. It was a question about international cooperation. Uh, since, that, you know, because of the Ukraine war, do you see that international cooperation uh, being effect affected? The question to to me or to yes, it's, a, it's a, to you. <laughs> yeah, of, of course. Yeah, it's a, you know you have this kind of of forces that affect you your work, the international cooperation. It's a, a little bit beyond your uh, how do you say your 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 forces. Um, but I, I'm convinced that in this context now, it's even more important to have this uh, international um, collaboration in the field of education and in the field of vocational education and training. Yeah. Maybe if I could just add something, uh, what Eric already said. Yeah. Um, in terms of the refugees, the Ukrainians, the, the Swiss system is that um, this will be distributed um, Ukrainian refugees are then sent to the different cantons and the cantons, the size of the cantons in terms of inhabitants uh, would then be the uh, factor based on which every canton gets a lot of fewer refugees and it has its obligation to then do its best to come up with extra um, educational um, classes to help the Ukrainian kids learn either German, French, or Italian, wherever they are, and to then later on be integrated into the um, school system, as is already the case for the Swiss or the uh, kids of residents who live in Switzerland. And hopefully, many of them will uh, end up with Eric <laughs> learning learning a trade and going through an effective uh, apprenticeship uh, experience. Um, yeah, inside of the uh, the chat from uh, Ian Aga Tap, also there's an important question is to see to ask why companies would bother because my personal experience also testify this in many cases apprenticeship apprenticeship is just a lip service. Very little learning, a lot of uh, <clears throat> sort of a substitution of labor. In the Swiss case, you know, you mentioned that there is a salary, uh, there is performance requirements, uh, and that is also sort of a, a mutual satisfaction. So, you know, perhaps there's something that you can say in a few words if it's possible, and then maybe leads to some, you know, related literature to address this question. Because I think it's very necessary for countries to reconsider uh, their strategy. Uh, another case in point is that uh, Singapore, for example, has been very uh, strong in moving into uh, a Swiss type of uh, approach to that uh, workforce development. And I think you know uh, more could be considered by other countries. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I will um, do in the chat uh, the link to to some some lit literature. Um, yeah, but but of course it's uh, if you have this uh, low lower wages or salaries for the apprentices, it's always a little bit you know a risk. Um, that this kind of exploitation of these young young people. Um, but on the other side, um, 
it's really a win-win situation. So um, um, because the, the apprentices, they, they really get the training, so they, uh, they get the competences to be able then uh, to work uh, or to, to be attractive in the labor market afterwards. So they, they get the qualifications. And on the other side, there are these small companies, or so for example, the hairdressers. Um, so there are some some hairdressers, for example, they, they couldn't survive without uh, without any apprentices. That's true. So um, yeah, it's really a win-win situation. Uh, but for the young people, the apprentices, so it's really a, they get the competences they are needed on the labor market after. Uh, you're, you're not muted. Yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much, Eric. You know, I think more can be said, and then we will, you know, have to take, move on to the next uh, in the contribution, the next lecture, focusing on what to do about mature students or adult workers who are working but in need to continue to also adapt to the new <clears throat> labor for labor, you know, workplace demands. And on that note, I would uh, invite you know, Mr. Paul Cumming to give his input. Mr. Cum Cumming is the Senior Skills and Employ Employability Specialist and working for the international organization. He has a very wide, broad range of professional uh, experience since he, he hailed to, uh, from uh, Australia and worked extensively in Southeast Asia uh, and <clears throat> in subcontinent of uh, of Asia but now he's working uh, based his work he's working and based out of Geneva but continue his uh, <clears throat> his mission around the world to bring some form of or official recognition to the prior learning so that allows adult to be able to to move ahead uh, in terms of uh, continued education in a more formal way, because I think the complexity of today's workplace, just intuitive learning or learning by doing or learning by watching are no longer sufficient. So the floor is yours, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us. You need to be unmuted, please. <clears throat> yes, you'd think that'd be sorted out by now, wouldn't you? But yes, thanks, Lajir, and um, uh, thanks for the invitation to be able to contribute to this event and welcome uh, to all the participants. Um, you know, you, you, you're obviously having quite a, um, uh, a, a uh, substantial uh, session today, and I hope I can uh, do my bit to um, add uh, a different perspective on some of the issues that uh, uh, Lucia has um, flagged in her introduction. I'm just going to share the presentation now. Sure, what that should be going to there. Uh, is that, uh, I have a thumbs up on that, please. Yep, very good. Okay, so what I want to do is really talk a little bit about um, SDGs related to skills development, um, but then also sort of unpack this idea that reskilling, upskilling, lifelong learning are connected and how skills recognition forms an important part of that, uh, of that cycle. Um, and then conclude with a couple of country examples uh, to demonstrate the sorts of initiatives that we're talking about. I won't dwell on the SDG part of it too much, um, other than to say, I guess it's the first time at an international level that there has been uh, an agreement on the importance of uh, lifelong learning and uh, targets set to um, set the aspiration uh, of member states in relation to that. Um, uh, unfortunately, the targets, the, I should say the indicators uh, that exist for uh, these different targets in SDG 4 and in fact other SDGs um, don't necessarily capture the full richness of 
um, the sort of attainment uh, and outcomes that are required, but certainly it's a start and uh, we need to recognise that the SDGs, uh, in particular SDG 4, but also SDG 8 relating to employment, uh, also place um, uh, you, you know, significant fresh attention on uh, the skills development agenda, on technical and vocational education and training. Uh, as well as uh, general education. And that also reflects um, a, a shift uh, in international thinking because vocational education and training and skills development is often seen um, and, and often funded uh, as a second best option, as a poor cousin of other sectors of education. And um, this issue continues to constrain the capacity of education and training systems to respond more effectively to. Uh, the needs of individuals and particularly adults, given the sort of labour market transitions that we expect to um, uh, become more apparent. And it's this international context, uh, I think, that we need to reflect on um, to, to some extent. Um, you know, in the presentation from uh, Andrew Schleicher, uh, you, you know, we heard some of these um, reference to some of the mega trends that are affecting the nature of jobs the type of skills uh, that are required. And clearly the COVID uh, crisis and the economic and employment crisis uh, that has uh, followed it um, is leading to an acceleration of some of the trends that we saw already in place in terms of how work uh, and skill requirements were evolving uh, in relation to the future of work. So we've got supply chains being restructured, we've got evidence of reshoring taking place um, you know, there's an article yesterday, I read yesterday, you know, claiming globalisation is dead because, you know, global supply chains are now going to be restructured in a way that we haven't seen for some time. The conflict in Ukraine clearly um, yet to play out in terms of the full economic and employment consequences that we see. Digitalisation, but also new occupations and activities, some of, uh, related to the transition to the low carbon economy, for example. Um, as well as ongoing demographic change. You know, all of these forces are really having a substantial impact on the labour market and also subsequently on education and training systems, which, you know, often do find um, or are challenged to maintain their quality and maintain their relevance when it comes to um, supporting the economic imperative for education and training, let alone uh, the, the, the sort of social imperative in terms of some of the changing skill needs, such as those uh, referred to by Andreas. So we've got things like, uh, you know, the end of routine tasks, growing importance of um, soft skills, so-called, or digital skills, um, and uh, the rise and fall of, of different uh, economic sectors uh, that are really um, leading um, uh, analysts to expect a lot more um, transitions in the labour market to take place. And I think, again, referring to Andres's presentation where the traditional model of a single model, uh, a single job following uh, a period of uh, education being replaced by multiple jobs uh, is increasingly the reality. And when you have multiple jobs, multiple you, you have multiple transitions in and out of work uh, that require support. Not only support, they, refly, they require more nimble, more flexible uh, and more responsive uh, education and training systems and intermediation services to uh, support those transitions particularly for adult workers uh, uh, and potentially low-skilled adult workers who are going to bear the brunt uh, of these transitions and need the most support to manage them effectively. So this is where we start talking about lifelong learning and, and in, in, in its broader sense, it reflects the idea of learning from cradle to grade, but often um, some organisations really just focus on the, the dimensions of adult education, um, labour market transitions, and uh, the need for upskilling and reskilling when they talk about lifelong learning. So the, 
the, the language of lifelong learning can be a little confused, is a little contested, um, but ultimately we need to focus on the reality that more and more people are going to require further education and training uh, to allow them to remain engaged uh, in the labour market and also to continue to actively contribute um, to society. So th there are some key factors that mean lifelong learning are uh, increasingly is increasingly important and, and we can't deny both the economic uh, and the social uh, aspects of lifelong learning and the importance of reskilling and upskilling within that um, paradigm. So here I'd like to introduce the idea of, of skills recognition uh, into the discussion. You know, we have obviously skills are developed through various formal, non-formal and informal uh, types of learning. There's different types of skills that are developed. Um, those skills are often recognised, but often they are not. Uh, and particularly with mature age workers, uh, with uh, existing workers who might have spent some years in the workplace developing their skills um, without formal qualifications, uh, without uh, or, or perhaps through a combination of practical work experience and informal and non-formal learning, which basically means any, any learning that you don't get a certificate from, um, when they go to um, uh, change jobs, when they go to updating they, their CV, when they start thinking about where they might move because the enterprise they're in is about to shut and the sector they're in is experiencing massive um, job losses, um, they need to uh, be able to uh, undertake some form of recognition process that gives some validity and some formal uh, mobility uh, to uh, the the, uh, the skills that they uh, have uh, and uh, uh, which have been recognised uh, through certification as a result of some skills recognition process. So this skills recognition process is really quite central to uh, the concept of lifelong learning as it applies to um, mature age workers and, and, and those in, and tr in transition for employment. Um, but around that uh, hang uh, various systems related to credit transfer, to pathways, to mutual recognition between institutions or between countries, and um, the, uh, wh whether or not we're talking about the recognition of prior learning or whether we're talking about the recognition of current competence, there's quite a lot of debates surrounding this broad topic of skills recognition. And some of those debates are born out in the different terms that you will see when you hear people talking about skills recognition. We've got recognition of prior learning or RPL, uh, which is uh, one approach. And we've got something else, uh, VNFIL, which is about the validation of non-formal and informal learning. Now, to you, they might mean exactly the same thing, but in reality, there are some quite... Um, uh, uh, discrete technical issues that differentiate these programs because it's one thing to say yes I acknowledge that you have undertaken this learning uh, non-formally that you've developed these sorts of skills uh, that you uh, demonstrate uh, a, a, a rich understanding of the work in a particular sector but it's another thing altogether to give you formal recognition uh, of that learning, particularly when a lot of education and training that exists, particularly in higher education, is very much based on an inputs model rather than an outputs model. So when you start talking about vocational training uh, and uh, skills development, it's very much about an ability to uh, perform at a, at a prescribed standard and be able to demonstrate underpinning knowledge and skills. That's a very different educational paradigm to that which exists in universities where a, a different curriculum model exists. And so whilst this might seem all a bit academic and a bit conceptual, it plays out very clearly in the way skills recognition practices and systems uh, are established. And these are the, some of the things that we have to address 
if skills recognition systems are going to more effectively um, support uh, the labour market transitions that I've been talking to. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this, simply to say that skills recognition is a contested um, system uh, or, 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 or feature uh, of, of education and training systems. Um, and, you know, I'll leave those there for you uh, for, for future reference. But one of the key points surrounding this, uh, this idea of skills recognition is improved guidance and support relating to learning and career pathways. We're not just talking about um, support and guidance for young people. We're talking about how um, mature age workers can understand what skills they have, how those skills connect to jobs in sectors that perhaps they haven't thought about, how can they undertake skills recognition to get their skills formally recognised, what gap training might be required to allow them to um, seek employment in a different occupation or a different um, uh, profession, and uh, what programs are available to allow them to do that, including apprenticeship programs such as those described by Eric, because increasingly programs like apprenticeships and the pathways that they provide into employment are not only targeting um, school leavers and young learners, but are increasingly being targeted to adults. And uh, the new uh, apprenticeship levy in the UK, um, you know, uh, degree level apprenticeships there, diploma level apprenticeships in other countries are growing evidence of, of the need to think differently about uh, how programs support adults to make those sorts of um, transitions. Clearly in this space, the importance of intermediary organisations uh, and employment services, both public and private, as well as the role that training organisations play in providing guidance and advice can't be ignored. And there's a real need to make sure that those institutions are fit for purpose that they have access to accurate labour market intelligence about trends in the labour market, that they make the most of digital technologies to make that information available and support um, the job seekers uh, in, their, um, in, in their journey. Um, but also we need flexible, more learning, fl sorry, more flexible learning solutions from the education and training system. And so we need more modularised, short course, um, flexible delivery arrangements um, that meet the needs um, of adults. I'm just going to end with a couple of um, sort of examples here. And in terms of the we'll upskilling... Be, uh, to Paul, I'm sorry, we'll be sort of uh, running out of time. So if you can fly by this two examples, we'll be sure. great. And yeah, we'll no worries. Them, uh, later. Yeah, okay. So this one is really just about highlighting the importance that upskilling and reskilling um, plays in local development, in uh, community development more broadly. So the principle here I want to communicate is that skills development doesn't exist in isolation. And so there needs to be coordinated action across different spheres of government and across different policy domains that doesn't just um, involve a conversation between the education and training sector, but a conversation between them and local economic development, regional development, trade, um, employment, um, investment, etc. Uh, and as illustrated in this case, um, uh, integrated district development in South Africa. Um, another point I want to highlight is this whole question of financing. You can't talk about financing of skills recognition and lifelong learning without talking about incentives. Um, incentives both for employers to uh, increase the levels uh, of investment in education and training, but also incentives for individuals. And it's in this space that we get into discussions about individual learning entitlements. Um, countries like France and Singapore have well-established, mature, integrated systems that are really best practice when it comes to um, providing the sort of holistic support and the financial means for individuals to undertake upskilling, to get released from work um, and to um, gain support for that upskilling effort uh, during the period of their transition. We've done a review of these kind of systems with UNESCO. There are elements of those systems that are um, 
uh, evident in uh, low, middle and high income countries, but it does require quite a mature uh, and coordinated approach um, that really shifts the, uh, the power, if you like, the purchasing power uh, and gives more to individuals, but the systems of support, the information systems and promotion that allows the adult learners to actually engage with that learning system and need to be in place as well. So to come to a conclusion, you know, you need to recognise that lifelong learning is a growing policy priority and central to achieving uh, the SDGs. Skills recognition forms an essential part of lifelong learning strategies, but that requires integrated and flexible support, financing and programming, which is based on sound labour market intelligence. And that's what's required to support effective reskilling and upskilling. And one thing I haven't mentioned up until now, which I can't leave without referring to, is the importance of tripartite engagement. We have three actors in the labour market, employers, workers and government, and they need to be equally consulted and involved in the design and implementation of solutions around upskilling, reskilling and lifelong learning for mature age workers. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Sorry for hurrying you because I realize I'm actually a very poor man time manager today and I have two more young speakers to follow you. But I would like to say something. I think your, <coughs> your presentation, your contribution echoed very well with the beginning uh, in terms of when we had the, the opening welcome speech, stressing the importance of governance. And governance that I sort of put the emphasis on, on policy coordination and policy coherence. And behind that is intelligence. You know, so I see that in order to, to put, you know, all the experiences, which is in different places and mainstreaming that into a national uh, skill development strategy and policy, we need to start thinking, you know, how to sort of to scale up and, and replicate and to make it more transparent and involve not only the policy makers and professionals who are dealing with skill development and educators, but the people themselves, you know, the individuals. And this, I think I refer back to Andrea's comment about individual agency. So that SDG is actually, and the 2030 agenda is actually a call for all individuals to take their own share of responsibility in making the process forward. Uh, it's not something about uh, being down to the population. And this is, I think, you know, something that I somehow struck me uh, during your talk. And with that note, I want to invite the two more uh, speakers of the day. Uh, they are the young people representing the younger generation of our life. One is uh, from uh, uh, Nigeria. The other one is from uh, Indonesia. So I apologize to two of you for you know being uh, late, and thank you for being patient and stay with us. I also thank the the audience on you know continue to stay with us and uh, for the the rest of the program. So let me first introduce Joshua Alade. He is the executive director uh, representing the Nigeria Youth SDG Network. He has been working both at the national level as well as international level in promoting understanding and awareness of SDGs as well as its implementation. So currently this network covers the whole Nigeria and they are also follow on on the SDG playbook as a way to get young people and you know, maybe even children to be interested and engaged in the SDG conversation. So the floor is yours. Uh, please give us uh, you know, your personal observation in terms of the quality of education and what needs to be done and could be done. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lecce. And standing on exi um, existing protocol, um, I'm just going to go straight to my presentation. Um, do I present or my slides will be shared? Yeah. 
uh, can, do you want to share the slides yourself or are you expecting us to do it? I thought you were going to be doing it. Okay, so it's coming. Sorry. But I'm glad to see that uh, you know you you are up and standing. <laughs> so I was getting a bit worried. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much and I, I really appreciate the support from the team thank you and it's i'm so excited to be speaking today about the school to work transition looking at nigeria itself and i'm just going to the next slide um next slide is just a little bit about me currently i'm doing my master's in um, sustainable development at the university of bradford and um at courtesy of the shevney scholarship program um i'm a positive development advocate um I'm a sustainability practitioner. I've spoken at about two or three TED, TEDx events, and I'm so passionate about meaningful youth engagement in the um, localization of the sustainable development goals in my country and across the world. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that really gets me um, thinking every time about my country, Nigeria, is the opportunity that young people bring. 65% of our 200 million plus population are young people under the age of 35. And then the median age of the Nigerian population is 17 years. So you see, it's a very big um, demographic dividend, looking at our population, looking at the, the energy that young people have, and also the advantage that technology brings. Um, every day on the street of Lagos in Ondo, in Abuja, in Portacourt, young people are looking towards digital technology as a means of um, getting into decent work. Next slide, please. Now, but there's that challenge. Schools are usually on strike. For instance, the, um, the data and um, the photo I have up there, um, it's saying that in about um, 264 months since Nigeria got into um democracy universities have been on strikes for more than 50 months so how are we going to prepare our young people for the future of work if universities are constantly on strike currently universities lecturers in nigeria are on strike um they've been on strike for the past two months um in, i'm just talking about 2022 university lecturers are really on strike right now so and this is looking at Another thing is looking at COVID, schools were on, on hold for about a year. How are we going to be able to provide the necessary um, jobs, the necessary trainings that our young people need to be able to compete meaningfully in the, in the world of work? And one of the things I always say every time is that the average young Nigerian is not competing with someone in Lagos. He or she is competing with someone in the UK, is so competing with somebody in the US, someone in South Korea. So if our schools are on strike, other young people are learning they are thriving so it will be very difficult for young nigerians to be able to um, navigate through um, the job market at the right time especially because they have to spend a lot of time at at home and the average age, so four years of universities but because of strike you end up seeing that the average young person spends six years um just staying um, in the university because of constant strike action. And another thing is about the education curriculum. And one of the things I would say is that the Nigerian educational curriculum actually prepares you to be a worker. It, it is archaic. A majority of the people who finish higher institution in Nigeria will tell you that their ambition is actually to become civil servants. Why? Because it's safer. Um, they are assured of pension. And then the, the, the education system does not teach you to be innovative. Um, rather, it, it, it's it, it also brings you in this mode to, to be more conservative, to be abusive of risk. But we, are, we live in a world whereby um, with the changing phase of education, with the changing phase of technology, we need to be able to embrace change. We need to embrace change fast. We need to learn fast, um, be agile in our approach and learning, especially with jobs that are coming. There's a lot of talk about the Internet of Things, NFTs, and every one of these things. But you discover that the education system in Nigeria is not even positioning young people for the future of work right now. And now, ne next slide. The result, youth unemployment. There's a rising youth unemployment gap in Nigeria. Um, as a result of COVID-19, youth unemployment went to about 54% in our country. Before the pandemic, youth unemployment was at 33.3%. So it, it just shows that even without 
the pandemic itself, we've, we've had underlining issues when it comes to youth unemployment in, in my country. And um, last year I did, uh, I gave a presentation um, with support from UNDESA to the Federal Ministry of Youth and Sports. And I, was, and, and I shared this research on, on the impact of COVID-19 on hard hit, um, on, on young people um, in hard hit um, groups. And one of the things I talked about was actually the aspect of the skills mismatch. So every day you find out that there are jobs, people, organization will tell you that they are employing, but they don't find, they don't have the right young people to, to employ people to fill this vacuum. It's not because these young people do not want to learn, it's just that the education system is not preparing them for the jobs of the future. Currently, I'm in the UK studying for my master's and you can see the career um, and guidance counseling um, units working directly with faculties, working directly with universities, working directly with the Ministry of Labor to be able to prepare young people for jobs over the next 10 years. And this is something that is really lacking in my country. And then that's why we're having the continuous brain drain. So if you go all over the world, you will find out that a Nigerian is actually doing amazing well, but they don't want to come back home because they know that back at home, they are not valued they are not being valid um a lot of young nigerians that you see I, I meet a lot of people who go on scholarships across the world and when you tell them can do you want to come back home to share your learning they tell you no it's better i love nigeria from abroad because nigeria would not respect or or would not value me another thing you find out is violent extremism because young people cannot go to school um you discover that they become um prey or they become easy targets to to, to bandits, to, um, to, to, to terrorists like um, the Boko Haram sets and every one of these things. So that, those are kind of the results that you see when there's not a lot of emphasis on education. And when I talk about education, I'm not just talking about tertiary education, but I'm talking about primary and secondary school education because as earlier speakers have said, that is the foundation of learning. That is the only way that young people can learn curiosity. That's the only way that young people can be able to, to, to understand how to think and not necessarily what to think. Um, next slide, please. Now, and one of the things that we also find out is that in my country, uh, young people are usually treated as an homogeneous group. You just feel that we, let's just put up something together for young people. Um, last, um, in 2020, there was, this, um, there was this campaign against police brutality in my country that was called the NSAS movement. And young people were talking about the need for government to create jobs for young people and also ensure that our lives are safe. And then the next thing that the government will respond with was um, they came up with a program called the Nigerian Youth Employment Action Plan, where they said they wanted to give out about um, uh, a huge sum of money over the next three years to young Nigerians in entrepreneurship. But this is not what young people are asking for. They're actually asking for, for the freedom to be able to be safe. They're asking for a, a, a conducive learning environment, They're asking for better welfare when it comes to, for, to, to lecturers and even their educational prospects. All of the times that people were on strike during COVID-19, um, when, there was, when there was lockdowns, the university um, across Nigeria were shut because the lecturers were not even prepared to understand how to go about with virtual learning. And this is, these are things that, that, that young people are talking about. So the first thing is around the issue of meaningful youth engagement. Involving young people in issues that has to do with the transition from school to work, understanding what the needs are, what are young people thinking about when, when they talk about Internet of Things, when they talk about social media, when they talk about using YouTube as a means of, 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 of being able to get skilled up, when it talks about vocational education itself, it's not just the, um, the normal brick and mortar way whereby vocational studies happen, but things need to change. And for it to change, you need to engage young people meaningfully from the beginning, in the middle, and in the end of the process. When it comes to policies, when it comes to um, programs implementation, young people need to be involved in every one of those things. Um, and this is one big challenge that is happening in Nigeria. And there's that issue of around education for sustainable development. How is our, our education system treat, treating young Nigerians to become global citizens? How is it treating us um, to be able to ask ourselves, how can we contribute, not just to the problems that we are facing as a country, but the problem of the world. And then we talk about the climate crisis. We're talking about um, a lot of issues around the world ourselves. And these are things that young Nigerians are asking for. Give us this room. And the, moving on to the, my next part about enabling environment to thrive. For, for the average young Nigerian, you feel that, um, for us, we feel that um, the government is actually against us. Like sometimes um, when, when we had the protest in 2020, in October, 2020, you had the government literally shooting at young Nigerians because they were asking 
for enabling environments. Uh, we, we need power, we need access to technology, we need internet to work, we just need our countries to be governed right so that we can be able to get jobs. We find young Nigerians who are working remotely because they feel that that's more appealing to work in other parts of the world. So provide us with this enabling environment to thrive. And this is one major act from young Nigerians. Next slide. And now, um, so one of the things that my organization um, has done so far is uh, in, when COVID happened, um, we worked with the International Labour Organization and the Ministry of Youth and Sports um, to, to ask young people across Nigeria that what does decent work mean to them? What kind of work and how do they want policymakers to support them in the light of COVID-19 itself, especially with their decent work aspirations? And then we had 212,000 young people 212,000 young people across Nigeria reach out saying the kind of jobs that they want and how they want government to support them. And it was through this that we worked on something called the Nigerian Youth Employment Action, uh, Nigeria Youth Employment Action Plan. And this, this action plan speaks to how the government of Nigeria will support young people with education, entrepreneurship, employability, and equal rights. And then the goal is that over the next three years, the Nigerian uh, Youth Employment Action Plan is going to create 3.9 million jobs for young people who have been affected by COVID-19 itself. And this speaks to our own work on meaningful youth engagement. And as our own contribution to ensuring that the Nigerian Youth Employment Action Plan works, we launched the Skill for Employment program last year. And for the Skill for Employment program, it was a prototype for us. We, we reached out to 90 young people under the age of 29 who had, either, who had lost their livelihoods or they can no longer go to school because of COVID-19. And we provide, and in, in doing a little bit one of these things, we did a research, yeah, thank you. We did a research and we found out that young people were interested in digital marketing, were interested in graphic design and website development. And then we partnered with hubs in Nigeria. So across these three states to be able to deliver this skill for employment program to 90 young people. Over 500 people applied for this program, but we could only take 90. Next slide. And now a lot of things that we've also been doing, we have been inspiring action to address youth demands in Nigeria. One of the things we are doing, we launched the SDGs Playbook. It's a resource that has been recognized by the United Nations as a practical step for young people to take action when it comes to sustainable development in their country. Um, and another thing we are doing is that we are, we are working with 20 activists with support from the Netherlands government to speak about youth issues in Nigeria itself. And then we are constantly supporting young people to be able to lead and thrive, creating stakeholders engagement program, focusing on the SDGs and how young people can support the Nigerian government and international development organization to be able to ensure that young people can lead and thrive. Final slide. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Joshua, for doing a fantastic uh, uh, <coughs> job in finishing on time. And I apologize, you know, for sort of a short change you in terms of uh, giving you the, the proper time and uh, allocation and uh, attention. But the one thing strikes me is that it's great that, uh, you know, you're being able to put the youth energy together and trying to do something uh, for, for, your, for your community, for your age group. But it seems to me that you know the that you know there's a need for greater social dialogue. And I recall what Paul said about intermediation, you know, between between individual life and collective life from what his words is from school to the workplace. I think you know the SDG sixteen seems to be under considered or undervalued uh, in, in your thinking because uh, I, I heard you before and you, you were very clear about the link between SDG 4 and SDG 8. And was, but at the same time, without enabling com, com, you know, environment, it is impossible. What do you think, you know, as a youth group, as a representative of the younger generation, how can you start a conversation uh, with the government so that you could also, you know, to move into rather than confrontation, but move into more of a problem, joint problem solving or co-creation process. Thank you so much, Lisha. So one of the first things we need to do is understand uh, more around um, power, the power dynamics and also the aspect of politics itself. We need to understand how to have 
um, difficult conversations with people in the within the corridors of power and that's something that we are currently doing um especially with my with my masters right now it's, it's i'm actually learning how to to have more conversation with the government um just earlier um, sometimes last month we reached out to the minister of youth and sports um saying that we want to have a consultation with him to just talk about the issues that young nigerians are facing and mm -hmm. how we can work together because the, the government have amazing plans but the, the the challenge is that they do not know how to carry young people along and this is something that we want to be able to bridge that gap um another thing i want to spotlight is that uh, we are we are making very meaningful progress when it comes to also involving the united nations in my country um in fact we for the ecosoc youth forum that is happening and between the 19th and 20th and we are organizing this meet and greet with the u.n resident coordinator for nigeria and then he has said that he's going to invite the, um like top ministers to the to, to this event to just have this constructive dialogue with young people we are not confronting you we are just telling you this is this is the challenge this is what we are doing and how can you work with us uh, or how can we also work with you to, to, yeah. to, to make things better for more young people, especially those people that, that are without internet access, those people that do not have an education, those people that are at the risk of violent extremism, what kind of programs are we put together to ensure that we save them? And that's where ZD16 comes in. Yeah, well, thank you very much for, for, for that, you know, perspective and orientation and attitude, positive attitude. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, we are all on the same boat, you yeah. know, <laughs> or maybe in different parts of the room of that boat, you know. So, so uh, without uh, such co cooperation and also uh, uh, sort of a shared journey, the SDG will not be reachable by 2030. So with this, I thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I won't uh, have time now for for the uh, for a uh, question from the audience so you know please uh, stay tuned in to have a check and see whether there's some comments coming in from there uh i thank you again and wish you fast recovery thank you yeah so let me introduce the last speaker but not the least it's a St stevie leonard harrison he's again also a young activist and young leader in trying to put his weight to bring a positive voice and also a positive development uh, in the process. So Stevie, he's uh, currently studying in the university and he's a founder of Inspirator, uh, Muda Nusam, Nusantara uh, in a youth group in Indonesia. So the floor is yours. Please share with us, how do you see through education an improvement of education that we can actually create, co-create a better world. So, please. Thank you, Professor Lichia, for your uh, introduction. Yeah, good morning, good uh, afternoon, and good evening to everyone here. I hope uh, everyone of us uh, will be in a good condition. So uh, yeah, as as we know that Indonesia this year will will hold uh, the presidency of G20 uh, in 2022, uh, bringing the theme of uh, recovering together, recovering recovering stronger, recovering together. So yeah, uh, I will like to present my uh, topic entitled Digital Transformation on Education as a Catalyst for Agenda 2030, a Reflection from Indonesia. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the global context will be about three points. Uh, the first one is about the connect, uh, continuity between MDGs and SDGs. It is from N uh, MDGs, uh, MDG2, Achieve uh, Universal Primary Education, or uh, coined term as uh, Education for All, has not been achieved globally in 2015. And uh, continued with SDG4, Quality Education is in Big Disruption due to COVID-19 pandemic. And there is also uh, the fact that uh, uh, a 100 year gap in uh, education uh, between the developed and developing world. Uh, I will explain on the next slide. Uh, and the third one will be about the, uh, sorry, about the digital transformation. Uh, is, 
consisting about uh, 825 million children around the world not learning the skills they need and gap in access to education have been highlighted further by the COVID-19 pandemics. And uh, there is also multi-stakeholder partnership and innovative policy breakthrough in digital uh, learning sustainability. Next slide, please. So yeah, I talking about the 100 year gap about uh, uh, bit, uh, between developing uh, world and developed uh, world. So uh, the report written written by Winthrop and McGivney in 2015 with, uh, for the Brookings Institution telling us uh, about the unequal access and uh, unequal outcomes. So if we look at the graph at the left, uh, it's about many years of schooling. Uh, there is a huge gap between uh, developing uh, regions and developed regions. So developed regions already achieve uh, 12 years. Uh, so yeah, it's all, already achieved the oblig uh, uh, the mandatory education attainment, but the developing regions only achieve almost uh, slight, uh, slightly uh, more than half of the developed uh, regions. So if we compare to the projections uh, that uh, uh, included in the report, so uh, it is the optimistic scenario when developed regions uh, will, 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 will achieve uh, 14 uh, years of schooling in uh, 2100 but yeah uh, now in 2022 uh, developing regions and uh, low income countries uh, uh, severely uh, affected by the covid-19 pandemic so the normal for the developed uh, uh, for developing uh, regions will be about uh, uh, less than 8 less than 8 uh, for for uh, prediction in normal scenario, but the pandemic uh, makes makes uh, the developing regions uh, slightly uh, more than six six years. So it's like a, a decadence for 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 now. So yeah, it's it's also uh, for low income countries uh, counted for uh, less than uh, less than six. Uh, and and only half about uh, four four, I mean for for uh, four years of schooling, yeah. Next slide, please. So yeah, it, uh, the one of uh, the most strategic pillar in in education policy is about the spending. So based on a uh, uh, joint report by UNESCO and World Bank uh, through Education Finance Watch two thousand twenty one. Notice that uh, government education spending for, for the really slow uh, middle income countries and upper mid, uh, middle income countries, uh, uh, it is st uh, relatively stagnant, but uh, it is uh, much higher than uh, lower in uh, lower uh, income countries. So, but uh, we see that the lower income countries have uh, ha have a, a, a trend, a dynamic trend about the government education spending. Uh, and then we, we compared with household education expenditure because uh, low in, uh, lower income countries um, uh, struggle with the lower uh, wage for, the, for their household. So yeah, it is taking about uh, almost, how, uh, almost 4% uh, percent of their GDP, but uh, uh, regarding the, the graph. So we can see that uh, lower middle income countries, upper middle income countries and high income countries will 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 spend less for the education in their household for the education. Yeah, next slide, next slide, please. So yeah, we, we, we share about uh, Indonesia. Indonesia is the world's largest uh, archipelago country in the world. And it is the world's third largest democracy with uh, with uh, strategic uh, geopolitical uh, constellation here in uh, between 
Indian, Indian Ocean and uh, Pacific Ocean. So yeah, if we if we talk about the education, we have to to mapping the structure of the school here. So Indonesia have uh, elementary more than 148,000 uh, schools and for junior high school it is uh, for more than 40,000 for senior high school almost 14,000 and for vocational high school uh, more than 14,000 and for the university is about uh, slightly more than uh, 3,000 uh, based on Indonesia Statistic Agency 2021 and for the spending on education uh, we see that uh, th there is a uh, uh, increasing trend to to spending uh, to spend on education the the state budget. So this year uh, we got uh, more than thirty billion dollar for 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 the government spending on education based on Ministry of Finance release uh, report uh, this year. So it's quite uh, quite good in the in this pandemic era because there is no uh, downturn here. So yeah, next slide please. So yeah, the dynamics here in Indonesia because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID effect uh, is about <clears throat> uh, 68 million students uh, shifted to distance learning or remote learning from their home. So and then uh, 40, uh, 40, 4 4 uh, million children and adolescents aged uh, 7 until uh, 18 years old are still out of schools. And we have, uh, because of our type of uh, state, past archipelago resulted in infrastructure uh, constraints and poor internet connectivity. And we then come to the last uh, dynamic, the uh, digital skills gap between teacher and student is widening because of, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. So based on the strengthening digital learning across Indonesia, a joint st uh, a study by uh, UNICEF 2020, they, they are recommending about three points. Uh, the first one, strengthening the digital learning content and platforms. And then the second one, develop digital skills of student and teachers. And the third one will be expand digital connect, uh, expand digital connectivity in schools. Next slide, please. So yeah, it is the opportunities in Indonesia. Uh, it's like a challenges for us, but uh, it's actually the opportunities for us. Like if we look at the higher education gross enrollment rate between 2015 until 2020. So the, the trend is increasing, although uh, in the last four, he, four years, it's, uh, it is only slight, uh, uh, slight uh, upward trending. But yeah, for the uh, pr proportion of schools with access to educational facilities, uh, the, the, the three uh, priorities area, his, uh, area here in Indonesia for, for school, are uh, electricity, uh, internet for uh, education, and computer for education. So based on the structure of the school, primary, uh, pr like primary school, uh, and then junior uh, secondary school, and then senior uh, secondary school, and then vocational school, it's uh, it uh, it has a, a, a bit a dynamics here. Uh, so uh, the government can 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 do uh, a better policy here to to make the, the 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 opportunities equal for for all type of schools. Uh, it is based on Indonesia Voluntary National Review uh, submitted in 2021. So next slide, slide please. Yeah, for the policy betterment regarding the understanding public policy by Thomas uh, Dai. Uh, we we know that there are three elements in the policy analysis, uh, uh, which are policy stakeholders, policy environment, and public policy. But I will emphasize more on the public policy because uh, uh, decisions makers are, are, are the key uh, 
for uh, for this for this one and then uh, supporting by uh, other stakeholders uh, the first point is delivering the deliverables where policies meet the needs of the people and then uh, the second one will be uh, maintaining public trust through policy credibility and integrity so yeah uh, indonesia is trying to 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 get to this point in uh, in uh, in, in the implementation of the public policy on education. So, yeah. Stevie, I Next know slide, you Steve. still have some to come, so I'm going to hurry you up. Can you finish yeah, in two minutes, please? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alicia. Next slide, please. So, yeah. For digital transformation, improving education, we, we are also shaping the competitiveness of young people here through digital connectivity, which is connected to digital education, digital literacy, digital competitiveness, and digital entrepreneurship. Where, where there is a urban and rural gap here for the con uh, access to the internet. Uh, yeah, for, a government has all uh, has providing uh, several policy to 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 bring the rural uh, prior. To bring the rural is priority for for education during uh, COVID-19 pandemic because remote re learning is uh, is very essential here in rural areas of the uh, archipelago. So yeah, uh, next slide please. Yeah, for for uh, there there are four uh, um, uh, element uh, here for improving education. Uh, the first one, raising digital learning and tech-based educational platform awareness, and then improving digital infrastructure, infrastructure and uh, promote digital inclusion and equity, and then partnering with private sector and other stakeholders on digital education development. And the last one, enhancing the national roadmap, roadmap on education 2020 until 2035. It is based on the uh, learning compass uh, to uh, 2030 by OECD, and there is uh, there are facts that uh, 15 education startups uh, has already developed here in Indonesia, and then also new satellite uh, communication for in uh, for uh, improving digital connection here uh, in Indonesia. Uh, it is the world. It is one of the world's largest uh, satellite. Uh, will be operated by 2023. And then for government spending is uh, have uh, in, uh, increasing trend for the uh, budget for education and more innovative and impactful program. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is like a, a highlight for my contribution in the goal for education. I met UNSG Ban Ki-moon in 2014 and I play my role as an educator and I join social movement and I, uh, I did uh, virtual coaching for youth here in Indonesia to, to raise their uh, improve uh, uh, competitiveness and uh, doing capacity building here uh, through youth led project. So yeah, next slide please. Thank you very much. Kamsamnida and terima kasih. I'm done, Lizia. Lizia, you are on mute. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Stevie, for uh, for a comparative overview between international attainment in terms of SDGs or the or the education in general, uh, and also with Indonesia. And you mentioned there's a sort of a, a major thrust for digital transformation, and I wonder. Uh, you know, because uh, previously we listened to Manos talking about monitoring uh, and citizen engagement in terms of uh, SDGs 4. What, I wonder what kind of thought that uh, you have that you, you think, NG, you know, young user groups and NGOs could also contribute to, to moving the, the government agenda forward. Thank you for the question, uh, Professor Alicia. Yeah, I think for the for the engagement for for young people here through collaboration and uh, cooperation with the government and also uh, with other stakeholders such as uh, private sectors, 
and then NGOs and then uh, academia like campus, uh, like campus, universities, think tank and research uh, organization uh, here. So yeah, in Indonesia itself, uh, we, 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 we did collaboration with, with other stakeholders here to develop uh, an integrated uh, education system. Uh, uh, not only formal education, but uh, informal education and capacity building on uh, technical and vocational uh, education. Mm. So yeah, I think for the it it, it has to be uh, aggressive to 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 approach uh, other stakeholders to engage in our agenda on education. Thank you, Professor. Well, thank you, uh, CV. I just have one last uh, little personal note, which of course I have the same question to uh, to Joshua, uh, since uh, I'm not sure he's still here. But you know, what what motivates you to be engaged as a young person? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think when 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 I when I uh, m met my passion on being an activist, being a youth activist is is like uh, it's like a, a natural call of life for me. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I think yeah. So yeah, I think for 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 being engaged in this uh, sustainable development goals. When I uh, when I uh, estab uh, when I uh, publish a guidebook an e guidebook uh, in 2017 promoting SDGs because uh, my organization is a member of uh, Sustainable Development Solution Network UNSDSN mm -hmm. so yeah uh, we, we write uh, we write the publication for for promoting SDGs to young people here in Indonesia, download, uh, download it by more than 5,000 uh, young people here in Indonesia to, to, to bring uh, to mainstreaming uh, SDGs uh, in, 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 in youth uh, education. So, and then we, we published also in Google Playbook in 2019 because we want to enlarge our, our reach, our audience to uh, to to make uh, to influence uh, our policymakers to to be uh, more ambitious in SDGs achievement, especially in uh, goal four. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Well, thank you. I'm very impressed and happy to hear to hear and see and you know a young person, uh, just you know still in the university but already decided that you know wants to engage and to you know also participate in terms of uh, public affairs and rather like in many places the uh, young people tend to flee away from the public space so uh, i want to salute you on that and thank you very much and also thank thank uh, joshua also you know because he's in similar situation and i'm glad uh, that we could hear two of you and i want to also thank all the distinguished speakers today you know for being with us uh, and i apologize for for our audiences who are participants who are remaining with us until now, even though we are way behind the schedule. Uh, I uh, thank you. And I just wanted to give the word for, for uh, <coughs> Dr. Ag Daragon. Before I do that, I wanted to just to, to mention that we do have a small evaluation form. Uh, you know, please, uh, we will send it to, send it to you all and please uh, address them so that we can continue to improve on our content. Uh, the content is uh, education seems to be routine, everybody knows, but it's, it's uh, actually a very complex uh, uh, thing uh, because it's multi you know, sectoral and it's all interconnected. So I'm happy that today we can unpack a little bit and go beyond what we normally discuss. Thank you. And so, uh, we look forward to your feedback and wish you a very good evening, afternoon, and day. Floor so, is yours, Jean. Thank you very much, Nietzsche. Um, I'll, I'll be very brief because we don't have much time. So, ladies and gentlemen, well, we had a very good start of the executive uh, training course for policymakers on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with this session. 
on goal four, edu uh, quality of education. Uh, I'll go very quickly. I have notes, but then I will not talk about. I will not uh, mention them. I'd like to thank the distinguished uh, opening speakers, Mr. Alexander Trepolkov, officer in charge of the Division for Sustainable Development Goals, the SDG at UNDESA, as well as Mr. Chong Yupa, head of office, UNOSD, uh, for their uh, very uh, insightful uh, comments and uh, and speech. Um, I'd like to dis to thank the distinguished speakers for their very, very informative inform uh, presentation and discussion today. We could not go discuss as much as we would like, have liked, but uh, I think that that was really good. Um, and so I'd like to just also to be, uh, to be fair, I'd like to, to, to name them, Mr. Andreas Schleicher, uh, Director of the Directorate of Education, OECD, and Mr. Mano Santoninis, Director of Team, the Global Education Monitoring Report Team of UNESCO, Mr. Uh, Raymond Sainer, uh, Professor Titular Organization and International Management University of Basel, Mr. Eric Swartz, Head of International Affairs, Swiss Federal University for Vocational edu Education and Training, SFUVET, Mr. Uh, Paul Kamin, Singer Skills and Employability Specialist, Skills and Employability Branch at the International Labor Organization, ILO, Mr. Uh, Joshua Aladi, uh, Executive Director, Nigeria Youth SDGs Network, Nigeria, and Mr. Steve uh, Arison, Master's Student at the School of Environment Science, Universidad uh, Indonesia, founding uh, founder of the Inspir Inspirator Muda Nusantari, Nusantara Youth Empowerment Organization based in Bandung, Indonesia. I'd like to thank all the participants who joined us today for this first session of the executive training for policymakers on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which we call the ETC between ourselves. Between ourself. um, please join us tomorrow, the 12th of April, for another uh, important session of, the, uh, of this uh, uh, training course, which will be dedicated on uh, global, uh, Goal 5 on gender equality. Of course, don't forget to also join us on the Wednesday on Wednesday the 13th and thir uh, Thursday the 14th of April uh, for the third and fourth session of the training course. I'd like to convey our special thanks uh, to you, uh, Ms. Uh, Alicia uh, Sanyar Yu, Professor UNOSD Consultant for your great contribution, helping UNOSD to organize the training and for your excellent work in moderating this session. I'd like also to thank our UNOSD staff and interns who work hard behind the scenes and to make this session, all the sessions, to run smoothly. And finally, yeah, thank you all uh, the people who, who joined. Please uh, join us uh, again tomorrow. So I uh, wish you a good day, evening, and or night, wherever you are. And uh, same, uh, same time tomorrow, please join us. Don't forget, do you need to go back to the website to find the link? or tomorrow, it's not the same link as today. So go back to the website, go for D2 to be able to connect for the second day. So thank you very much to you all and uh, yeah, pleasure to see you tomorrow again. Bye. Well, thanks, Jean. Thank you.